Hello folks and welcome to our game with myself Shane Stills. I'm joined as ever by Michael Verney and delighted to say we have former Wexford, Wexford Carlo, Kerry, Cork. You've, you've managed them all John Minor, how are you? Yeah, I've been around the country Shane morning. I'm about to leave now so get on with it. <laughs> I've been around the country Shane. And you, you, where are you, are you after? Was, sorry? Where are you after? I'm off to playing a bit of golf Shane, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I retired. I retired six months ago. I've had. I've, I've done my time. I've done my time. You know. So. And how's the golf game going? That's good. I I played off four or five a good few years ago, but I can't get back now. Uh, I've two hips done in the last twenty fifteen years. Um, I can't get back to where I I was really. You know. So I play social golf. Play for a bit of crack. Have a pint afterwards. And uh, I really enjoy a couple of buddies I play with, and I enjoy the company and the crack. So, and it's great exercise. So, I'm exercising, doing a bit of cycling and swimming. So, I'm just kept going. That's it. Yeah, joys of life, isn't it, Michael? Yeah. Does retirement mean you have more time for teams, John? Or uh, I presume you're still you're still involved down in Kerry? Are you yeah, I'm still in, I'm still involved with Kilmaidy and uh, with the Cork under 16s. But what it means is is that there's more administration. So I probably spend an hour, two hours every morning on the laptop just tidying up, you know, what's on, you know, with the under sixteens with Kilmoyley and that. It's it's more and more really like where Intercounty was twenty four seven. You know, the, the club, there's little bits and pieces, fellas injured, arranging matches, things like that. A lot of young fellas away now, Michael, they're away in third level, so you know, I mean, they're not at home training with Kilmiley during the week. We four fellas in college. So, you know, um, you have cows calving and farmers at this time of the year. So there's an awful lot of things, you know. There's, so. there's one for you, John. Just wondering, what, uh, down through your years, what's the the best slash weirdest excuse you've ever got for somebody not turning up for a training or a match? Well, Paddy O'Connor, who's playing midfield with Kerry at the moment, and he's a, he was a farmer as well, milking cows, and he rang me about half six and he said I won't make training he said the cows are um, disagreeing with me this evening like but um <laughs> that's that's you know and I remember um I'll mention his name Sean Crowley he's playing with um Cork at the moment he's on the extended panel and that and Crowley was with me at under 15 and under 16 and he came to me you know when I was involved with the 15 seven or eight years ago and he said John I can't make training on Saturday and I said Sean Jesus it's important you know we need everybody there and he said, no, John, I, I can't make it. I have the All-Ireland Accordion finals in that low on at the weekend. So I said, Jesus, I said, where did this come out? So John's grandfather is a unbelievable accordion player, and that's why he, he's a great man on the squeeze box. So, you know, there's some cow's cabin. and <laughs> He might he might miss training or miss a game, John, but the crack that he'd be able to generate with the accordion Afterwards, after. Yeah. yeah, but he was a superb young fella, a great young fella, Crowley, and... Um, you know what I mean? The, the accordion and and uh, the Kerry boys with cows calf and they ring you like and that's it. I go and make training like and you know the excuse is genuine. <laughs> you know, whereas the fella said, "Oh, I've COVID or I have the flu." Like that's a fella who doesn't want to go training. You know. So <laughs> yeah, there's a lad from Burris Lee who who didn't uh, take a call from the tip miners because uh, farming. Yeah, so you have lads to do that. And then yeah. also I remember in Kula several years ago now, and you shouldn't put this on the group where all the players see it. He was like, lads, I can't make training. My girlfriend had booked uh, dinner for my birthday, uh, so I can't make it. I mean, what's that are you on? That's not an excuse, Shane. That's, that's not an excuse. Um, <laughs> no, that was in the years where we weren't winning, no. Surprise, surprise. Um, how do you think Cork have been going so far this year, John? I think they've been going really well. Um, I think the first day out, they started against Limerick. Limerick took the, the foot off the gas, you know, in the last 20 minutes of the game, made substitutions and that. But Cork were competitive that day, and they've done really well in the league to date with the young fellas. Um, and they've tried an awful lot of the young fellas, Owen Downey at full back and things like that. Um, and they've eaten two million doors. They've brought in the young fellas. The problem will be now going to Kilkenny on Sunday at four o'clock. Um, and, you know, the old usual games against Kilkenny and Nolan Park is going to be tough. It's going to be hard. And Cork are going to get the test that they wanted. Um, and I, I remarked to Donal O'Mahony that it was vital that Cork would win that game on Sunday and give them another game before the Munster Championship because they're not out the first Sunday, the first weekend in the Munster Championship. So they're going into the second round fixtures cold. And I think they need another game in two weeks' time than in the league final. So it's important. But 
you know, it's it's very positive. It's it's the work rate has gone up from previous years, um, and I like it. And they're scoring and things like that. And then you also have like Lehan came on last week. Seamus is back in again, and and uh, there's positive signs, really positive, young, energetic, young players. But it's going to be difficult looking at the at the um, the environment that they're in going to Nolan Park. Um, Kilkenny have been not exactly you know flying on all cylinders and uh, the bits and pieces stuttering here and there but they've got over the line they're into a semi-final and you know the way they'll take semi-finals um, they'll go at it the crowd will turn up on Sunday and uh, Cork need that extra game to get over them then but, John, but very what's positive it, what's it like bringing a team to Nolan Park what are you trying to get the players to um to prepare themselves for like is it the environment itself or like is it how the crowd gets up for it when the Kilkenny lads do something good but it's it's, it's just Kilkenny in Nolan Park you know what's coming you know what I mean you don't have to say this is going to be hard it's going to be tough it's going to be difficult and there's a huge challenge there playing Kilkenny on their home patch and and as I said like you know Kilkenny don't have the team that they had 10 15 years ago um, but Ling has taken over from Cody, so that's a, a challenge to him as well to get it going. The crowd at times in Kilkenny were giving out about the shorthand passing game, um, which they didn't want to see. They want to see more traditional. So I, I think if, if Kilkenny are positive and go, I'm not saying long ball, but more direct ball, then the crowd will get behind them. Um, and Cork, you know, will be will be fast, mobile, etc. But it's it, it's a difficult environment to get in there and uh, you know it's a challenge for for pat rhino and donald really to get going and they need as i said they need that extra game shane michael they need that extra game before the monster championship because looking at tip and and, and limerick uh, the way they've gone in the league and that um, the extra game will stand to them just john when you mentioned about playing kilkenny is it just that you know that your metal is going to be really tested like that you're not going to get anything soft at all that you're going to have to kind of you know you're going to have to win a lot of kind of tough physical altercations is that where but maybe with some other you know what i mean that's the type of game that they play like that they, they play a physical game they'll play it whatever way you want them to play it they play a physical game they've good touch they're strong men they can all hurl every one of them can hurl and I was only just remarking to people during the week there that that you know that Cairns won the All Ireland Colleges again, and they're 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 providing all of those young players to Kilkenny over the years, and you know Walter Walsh and those guys. It's hard. It's physical. It's uh, it's tough, and it'll really find out where Cork are in terms of their you know their preparation for the championship and the league campaign that they've had to date. So it'll be tough. You know, it's fair. They've always been fair. I, I've never criticised Kilkenny for anything other than, than you know, beating us or whatever. Uh, but uh, the hurling will be hard, honest, and fair, and you're going to get a game there, and that's you know that you know. What's can I coming. just can I just ask one other quick thing, John, about the league? Uh, the league has changed a small bit, maybe since you were manager, as in the proximity to the yeah. championship. Would you yeah. would you be changing your approach much? Like people would say oh, some team took a pull last weekend or they weren't going all out. Like, is it even possible to do that as a manager? Like, you, you're you never no. going to say to your players, oh, don't go 100% this week. But how would you be How would you be treating the league now if you were a Cork manager, shall we say? I, I, I would be treating the league seriously. I'd be trying to find one or two players. That's what every manager does. But under no circumstances would I be trying to, you know, pull any game or things like that. Because... And I said this to Don like that. You're 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 four or five weeks out from Munster Championship. You haven't you you haven't got a first round game. So you really need to hit the ground running. You need an extra game here. So the league is vital. And it, it annoys me that a lot of people were criticizing the league and the league was this, the league was that, the league was only worth somebody said two euro coin or something like that. I think that's very disingenuous to uh, the, the sponsors, Alliance, the GA and that. The league has to be taken seriously to try and find to try and blood young fellas. And Cork have done that with with, with a few young fellas eating two meat oh, and downy dose fellas and giving them more time. And Pat has done that. So you know, you're 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 going you're judged in the GA on your on your championship. That's what you're really judged. You're not judged on the league, you're judged on your championship performance. And um, you know, the round robin thing is very competitive, very difficult, very challenging. You have to hit the ground running. And looking at Limerick, the way they've treated the league this year compared to last year, 
you know, they're, they're, they're introducing one or two players every week of the senior players. Galan was back, you know, they're giving more game time to fellas and things like that. So it's going to be competitive and uh, you have to be ready for the Munster Championship. And you had a number of these um, young Cork players through your hands in recent years with the underage system. Could you talk to us about a few of those players and who you had? Ah, th- th- like that's you know, Tommy O'Connell now was centre back with us. I remember at 15, 16, that's going back 2015, 2016. Tommy was a bit erratic, um, you know, and where we would play him and things like that. So we kind of fixed him around the, um, the midfield area at that age. Lovely hurler, really, really, really good hurler. But like Ben O'Connor going to Middleton to win a county with Middleton, Ben put him centre back, and I think that's kind of solidified Tommy there. Um, Tommy's a really, really good hurler. Um, so he'll be there, thereabouts in the half back line. Um, strong, tough character. Then you had the two roaches, and it's quite um, I was saying funny about the two roaches, but the, the two roaches were with us at under 15. And I remember saying to them, Look, lads, I'm going to put you with the B team the, in under 15 tournament, which was playing up in Clare uh, at that stage. But you're going to play minor for Cork in three years' time. And what the two roaches had, they were, weren't massive big fellas, but what they had was an unbelievable work ethic. And uh, they come from Bright Rovers, which would be the club of Brian Murphy. So y- you you obviously just pick out what they had. They had Bright Rovers toughness, Brian Murphy toughness about them. And, you know, everybody knew at the time that they would go on and they they, they played minor for us. And then they won their under 20 other, and now the two of them are playing senior. So, like, look, um, they're, they're, they're wonderful, two wonderful young players. You, Sean Toomey, as I said earlier about the accordion, to me, as a guy, six foot three, big man, you know, strong, um, great hand. If he can get the ball in his hand, uh, he's an excellent player, plays with Corsi Rovers. So there's a lot of young talent there, Shane, really, really, really coming up. But it's a matter of bringing them through now to senior level. And the step up on Sunday against Kilkenny is going to test them because, you know, Walter is on or Walter is not playing or Walter doesn't start. Or the Ballyhale fellas, TJ, and those, they appear suddenly. You know, you don't have much room uh, for error. So um, there, 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 there's great young talent there at the moment. But it's, it's it's you know, better than I do from Tipperary. It's getting that talent like in Cahill has done that now with those under-20 Ireland fellas as well. So um, tough. Yeah, mm. but- Hurling one, two, three forces. What have you made of Roach and Toomey at midfield? And I think more so here, Parik Power and Brian Hayes up front as new players. Yeah, they look, look, Brian Hayes has come out of the bars. He's son of Paddy Hayes, nephew of Joe Cunningham. So big tile, and he opted for hurling over football. So um, Brian is, you know, getting his point or two. Um, and Eaton Toomey at midfield played well for the bars there. Young Barrett has been in and out of the cock panel for the last um, year or two years. So, look, all of those players are good players, Michael uh, and Shane. But you're going to be tested uh, on Sunday. You're going to be tested in Nolan Park. And, you know, Cock will sit back, uh, Pat will sit back and, and, and review the game on Sunday and see how they perform. I think that's the bottom line here. These guys know we'll get a test on Sunday because knowing Kilkenny, um, they'll want to win the game. They want to win every game. You know what I mean? And and that's their 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 you know their core ethic of of winning games and getting on with it. And you know, um, come and talk to me at five o'clock on Sunday evening, and then you'll you'll know where they are, Shane. You won't, I won't have to ring you or anything like that. <laughs> I'm just asking, John. Do you think you've have you seen evidence of a bit more doggedness? About Carl yeah, there's more work. Rate. Yeah, yeah. There's, 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 there's more work rate like that. Um, you know that the, the the work rate definitely has gone up, and uh, well, it had to go up really at times because we've a lot of very good forwards, and and you know really give them the ball and they'll score. But the you know when the opposition has the ball coming out of defence, then cock forwards tend to let them off a small bit, and you cannot do that at the moment. But like, look. That that work ethic pattern, Donald have brought that work ethic in. Um, you you know it'll be tested. It'll be tested um, on 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 Sunday and in the league final and really more so now, Michael in the in the um, in the Munster Championship, um, which is going to be really really ultra competitive again. So the work rate is up, but it's a work in progress as distinct from a, a consistent work ethic. 
John, what do you think of the the amount of injuries? And it's not just Cork, because I'd say you'd say the same for Waterford, for Tip, for Wexford. I think they're actually glad of the break. But like, 13, Alan, think, yeah. yeah, like you've got Alan Connolly, Dara Fitzgibbon. Um, I think even Decky Dalton and Seamus Hardy might have picked up knocks last week. There's a lot of the frontline players from Cork who are out of action at the moment. So it actually makes it doubly impressive that they've won every game, but not ideal heading into Munster. Yeah, but look, that's the, you know what I mean? I'm not on the inside of the camp, but it, that's the training techniques and, and what guys are going through. And, and uh, you know, I, I think in, and I've said this before, I'm not sure that I say it to you, but that the, the, the pre-season in GA is miles too long. You've pre-season of probably three months, four months, and, and players are just running to the ground and things like that, where if you go back and look at the professional um, approach um, in the Premier League, it's six weeks training. Uh, even even less, um, you know, three, four weeks because fellas are fit and it's, then it just takes three, four weeks to pop that up. Whereas in, in the GAA, uh, people tend to run players into the ground and um, and as a result of that, get injured. So, uh, you know, I would say a, a shorter pre-season, but look, that's, that's another day's work. Oh, I couldn't agree anymore. And do you know what? Another thing, Michael, I'll even throw this to you. I was chatting to um, to a runner the other day and uh, just talking about injuries at this time of the year. And one point that was made to me was you've got players who are going from maybe Astro one day to heavy pitch the other day to a wet Astro the next day if it's raining and all this kind of stuff. It makes it very hard on your body, especially if you haven't had enough recovery time. Well, I always found it in the last couple of years, uh, my knees and hips wouldn't be great for real hard surfaces like that. So if I, if I went from an all weather to a pitch a couple of days later, I don't know, but I'd be aching my hips. It just it's a different different type of an impact. Um, your different type of fatigue. Um, coming off an astro pitch, which is to me, it's really unrealistic. It's great to play games there when there's no other option, but it's totally like unrealistic to what happens on a pitch the ball like i always think it's a forwards game like the dome in the dome uh open connect is an unbelievable facility but like it's a fo- it's a forwards game it's all perfect touch you'll never miss a ball you never walk out over a ball or like that whereas you go out on the pitch it's completely different and it's the same for training uh something i wanted to throw to john john what's it like when you have you know a big injury list like that are you like how much time are you putting into you know making sure if you've 10 lads out injured checking up with all of them, making sure their rehabilitation programs are right, making sure you're integrating them back in right. I imagine that's very challenging because like I'm just thinking, just say a lad's not available for the first round of Munster, but you think he'll be available for the third round. You have to... But that's that's yeah. where you need... I, I, I go back and there's an awful lot of talk nowadays about the manager, inverted commas, and how important the manager and who the manager is. The manager really is only the front guy. What you have around you is your environment and part of that environment is is the medical team the doctor you know surgeon whatever physios they're the guys that keep the the bus on the road really they're the guys that keep players from getting from not getting injured and it's injury prevention which is more important than than injury cure if you if you understand me you're, you're trying to prevent players from getting injured like you know harnad you know for instance you know he's been in and out there the last few years and and things like that. You're you're they're trying to get him right for the Munster Championship. So there's certain players you're trying to get right for Championship date uh, in the middle of April. There's certain players then that you know I mean you you probably need to have a look at in the league because they're not going to play in the Championship. So the medical team and and that whole setup, Michael, is critical. Um, and having really really good guys and then having really good access then. To guys like Ray Morn or Ina Falvey or those and George Arden here in the affiliates in Nick and Cork. So you really need um, you know, a really strong medical setup and injury prevention. And this is where I go back to what I said to you a minute ago about running the living daylights out of people in, in pre-season. You're overloading them. Whereas they already have a base of fitness from the previous year. So it should be just to top it up. Like my own fellow when he went back to to holler when he went back to Sunderland for 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 preseason, it was six weeks, and he said, "Yeah, Dad." He said, "This is going to be tough. It's going to be hard. It's going to be twice a day." And I went over and I said, "Jesus!" I, I thought it was quite, you know, okay. It wasn't really really challenging. Do you know what I mean? Um, and a lot of GA players are just running to the ground, and um, you know. 
Can I just ask you one one other quick one, John? You mentioned there about Seamus Harnady and older players, and basically, like, and it's the same with Shane O'Donnell and Clare. You want yeah. him ready. You want him ready for championship. But what right. are the? How do you balance that with you know a younger lad who needs to train every night and show up the whole time? Do, are there conversations you have? Do you make the squad aware that you might have to treat you know the yeah, more but you, you, that you, a bit different? Yeah, you 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 probably have three different levels in 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 any camp in any setup because. You have the guys starting off, you have the guys in the middle, and you have the guys at the end. So you have Harnedy, Hoggy, um, Lahan, and those. You need those guys in, in, in the Munster Championship in April. No, the middle ground fellas would be a fierce worry for me at Cork at the moment, like Fitzy, uh, Tim O'Mahony, and Mark Coleman. They're not they're not around there at the moment. Um, so like my aim there would be that that you would give them maybe 20 minutes against Kilkenny on Sunday, or if you got into a league final. And in two weeks' time, that you'd give them a go, or you'd have a challenge game arranged, you know, with somebody to try and re reintroduce. And then you have the younger fellas, as I said about Tommy, about the two roaches, about Sean Tommy, Padre Power, those kind of guys. Then you know, I mean, they're going to do a little bit more work than what the the older fellas are. So you have, but that's the key, Michael. You have to manage the three different groups, and with everybody, with them. Um, with everybody in the setup, with the medical team, with the training team, the fitness team, the strength and conditioning, all of those. And that's where it, your your individual plans are critical. And, you know, my own fellow, when he was in the premiership, he really, really good access to trusted, trusted physios. Dave Bingsley, no, that was at Sunderland. He's with Liverpool now. So, uh, or Man United. So really, really good people to know how to solve the problems it's it's yeah. it's how to solve injury issues and you know fellas have problems it's how to solve them and you need to do it the year before if, if you know you need to be looking at injury six months ago nine months ago as this thing from that was too late now because you, you there's very little you can do about it so it's preventative um preventative maintenance you really need to do John, a final thing, I'm, I'm sure you, you have to go off with your tea time, but a final thing, just in terms of Pat Ryan, he doesn't really do the interviews we see Wayne Sherlock doing them. I did actually interview him about three years ago. Nice, personable guy. What can you tell us about him and his approach to Hurling McCork? He, I was involved in 17 and Pat was doing the coaching in 17. Uh, straight up, no bullshit. Um, you know what I mean? Um, I had many stars to win two county championships in Cork there a few years back. So, good guy. <clears throat> knows he's hurling keeps it quiet and uh, there's no fuss about him um and you know he was with most of those young lads doing 220 all Ireland's. um and he's good people around sherlock and and you know what i mean i've great time for donald Manny. i think he's excellent and um, very calm you know what i mean um so he's a good team around him, uh, and then he has the benefit then chain of all of those under 20 all Ireland's. the same as cal and tipperary so and they would know them inside out. They know what makes them tick. They know what doesn't make them tick. They know their weaknesses, their strengths. And Cal is exactly the same in tip with those two hundred twenty dollars. So, look, it's it's going to be really, really fascinating, interesting uh, monster championship this year. Oh yeah, and actually, Michael was uh, keen to know who are the three teams that are going to come out of monster this year? Do you reckon? I don't think there's much debate. Um, really, I think it's Limerick, Tip, and Cork. Um, I, 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 I think. Look, you, 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 you have the same problems with Walford. You've Austin, whether he's injured, whether he's not injured. Austin is a huge uh, part to play in Walford. Uh, Connor Prunty is injured as well, um, and they were unlucky to be injured in the last few weeks. I, I honestly don't know what Clare are doing. Um, I just can't see them. You know, filling the gap in the next month, really. I, I think the the Apache League. You know, they promised more last year. They didn't deliver. They're always promising and then don't deliver. And for that talent of player that's there, Tony Kelly and those guys, they're not giving enough, really. Um, and and when it matters, it matters now. Um, and I expected more from them last year against Limerick. Um, um, last year, I, but I just see. Limerick will 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 um, the only people that would beat Limerick would be Limerick themselves. Um, that's all. Uh, I, I looking at them, 
Um, I saw them down here in the park and they pulled up and then the other matches they've won. Um, they're, they're, it'll be interesting though playing Tipperary because uh, I think Tip will want to have a cut as well. I think Tip are going really well. I think Cal, as I provided he corrects the wrongs of, of last year with Waterford in the um, before the Cork match, the two weeks train before the Cork match. I think if he corrects that and sees that 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 true, and then um, uh, Cork will come. I think Cork will 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 give it a rack. In fact, Waterford have lost home advantage in Walsh Park is a massive blow. Even though they love playing in in Turles, I don't think don't that won't be a massive negative. But I just I just see Limerick Tip and Cork coming out, um, and then you have. Um, you have on the other side, you've Galway, you've Kilkenny. I honestly don't know what Dublin are or where Dublin are. I, I've been really disappointed with them. Um, I saw Wexford and um, Wexford were short uh, players, uh, even though they were here now in the park. And, and uh, they had the, they, they had a chance. Jack had Jack O'Connor had a chance for a goal. Patrick Collins made a great save. And then Matthew O'Hanlon going off injured was was a massive loss just in that league game because apparently he went in on the square and broke the ball. Um, and Wexford, if, the Wexford, there's a few players gone off the Wexford uh, panel. So... You know what I mean? The third place in Leinster is going to be difficult. Um, mm. You know. Well, brilliant stuff, John. Really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed around the golf. I will. I will. And I think about you and I. <laughs> I say you will. Huh? Thanks, John. I say you'll yeah. be thinking about us. All right. Thanks, oh, I, I, I'll, I'll be thinking about you. All right. Don't worry. Good luck. <laughs> all right. Cheers, John. Good luck. Good luck. Okay. Brilliant to have John on. He's always great entertainment. Well, and really insight. Remember a fact about Munster. One day, like most people are, you know, humming and hawing or whatever, but he was fairly matter of fact about it. And I think people need to get their comments in. Do you agree with John there? Is it going to be as simple as that? Like he said, it's pretty simple, actually, didn't he? Wasn't that yeah. the term he used? You know, it's going to be Limerick, Cork, Tipperary, and there's no more There's no more about it, really. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Uh, Cut, there was a couple of interesting things he said. Um, the layoff for Cork between league and championship is interesting because I remember Limerick, kind of sleepwalking into that Cork game. Remember that round two game in 2019 where Cork beat them down in the Gaelic grounds? And the benefits of having a game going into round two, I think, are huge. So I do think Cork will make a right good blast at the league. Um, just some real interesting stuff around injuries and the team you need around you with it as an inter-county manager and that type of thing. Thought it was, uh, that was fascinating stuff. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. So um, where do you think Kilkenny are at coming into this game? Now, I, I just want to list out the players who have done the scoring for them so far this year. Billy Drennan, he scored 152, 112 of that from play. Uh, Mossy Keown scored 110, all from play. Owen Cody scored 2-5 two, two from play and two frees. John Donnelly, 10. Paddy Deegan, 6. Billy Ryan, 6. I mean, obviously, Adrian Mullen and TJ Reid haven't been there, but... Without them, and we're going to assume that those two guys aren't going to play this weekend, Like, do they have the firepower from what you're seeing? Not sure uh, if they have the firepower this weekend, to be honest with you. Um, and I remember going, thinking back to the, the Cork uh, Kilkenny game this time last year. Wasn't that seen as a big statement win by, Kilken by Cork, I should say, because, down at the yeah. park? Yeah, and I think Kilkenny had... Uh, did TJ play? TJ mightn't have played that evening, but I think they had a pretty much full strength outside of that. And it was a rip roaring game, I can remember well on the Saturday evening. Um, so it's, um, yeah, I, I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure what to make of Kilkenny so far. It's hard enough to get a read on them. They would have had to play uh, a style maybe that's unfamiliar to them and unsuitable to them against uh, Waterford last weekend. I'd expect it to be not necessarily straight up but it would be a good bit more straight up than it was than it was last Sunday and I think from a car point of view and John kind of mentioned it there you kind of have a fair idea of the physicality that Kilkenny are going to throw at you and I suppose that's the question that's been thrown at Cork the last couple of years and whether the forwards work hard enough um, and I think John kind of said it there they're definitely I remember just seeing in the Limerick game in the second half when Hoggy made a hundred yard dash just to just to cover off a run just to tag would say a runner they need that. We know that they can all score and put up huge tallies. It's that kind of robustness. Are they going to front up with and get big tackles in and turn around the defender? Do you know what I mean? Rather than maybe a lad walking through. Um, and they're going to they're going to get a fair bit of physicality at the weekend, and we'll we'll hopefully learn a bit more about them. I'd probably be expecting Cork to win um, realistically, just based on 
You who what? questions Cork at every turn, you think they're going to man up at Nolan Park of all places? Yeah, no, I think they'll get a result, yeah. I think they'll get a result. Um, They've probably they've been a good bit more consistent than Kilkenny throughout the league, I'd say. Now, Kilkenny have been a lot better since the Tipperary game. Um, But it's mad when, jo- when John went through some of the names there that we haven't really seen. Dara Fitzgibbon, Tim O'Mahony, uh, Mark Alan Coleman, Connolly. Alan Connolly. A lot of, like, there's four, like, basically nearly guaranteed starters. So... How kind of Pat Ryan reintegrates those guys back in when they're fit is going to be interesting as well. And see whether some of those lads potentially get game time this weekend will be kind of fascinating too. And I I, I think that's why they need to get to a league final, potentially too, to get a, a 20 minutes into a guy who's going to feature at some stage in Munster. Yeah, just a reminder brought to you about our store.ie. Also on our game.ie, we have an article here with the top goal scoring teams in Division 1 so far. So I think it's interesting here that Kilkenny have scored just four goals in their five games so far. Contrast that to Cork, who have 12. Uh, most conceded, both Cork and uh, Kilkenny have just four conceded each. Then I, I just always find it interesting, just the scoring differential. Kilkenny are plus 26, Cork are plus 14. And that's Cork with five wins out of five. So it's not like they're absolutely destroying teams either. They're getting wins. They're obviously picking up confidence on, on the route. But um, like against Limerick, they won by a point, 217 to 22. Against Galway, really high score, 424 to 322. Against Westmead, and they changed the team around, 221 to 21. Uh, had a turnaround victory against Wexford, which was similar to the Limerick one, and they're getting used to winning from behind, which is really positive, 214 to 18, and then drew 218 apiece the last time out against Clare. So, yeah, they're unbeaten. Sorry, they didn't win five from five. They're unbeaten. I and, prefer like, to see Cork win in tight games, just on the score difference, rather than blowing teams away, if you get me, because I think they're more character building wins, and generally, over the past few years, they haven't been winning tight games. So, I'd be nearly, I think that's nearly more of a positive than winning by seven or eight. Yeah. Okay, we're going to talk about the other semi-final shortly. Now we have uh, John Evans on the line here. John, how are things with you? Very good. Uh, keeping the bright side out, bright and early this morning. You are. You look like you're going to go out and do a bit of coursing or something like that, go after the hairs. Oh, I've just done my yoga lesson for about an hour and a half there, so I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 find, I find it hard to know whether you're being sarcastic or not, John. <laughs> no, I look after the body pretty well, but, um, you know, uh, very important because... I've always believed that you've got to look uh, energetic, um, you know, feel energetic and, and feel good about yourself if you're, if you're coaching or training a team. You know, you've got to be activist, to be a, a skip in the step, as they say, you know. Yeah. Mm. If you can't bring energy to the table, then how you have to, you, what, what comes from you, your players have to see that and kind of bounce off that, don't they? Yeah, they have to see that energy. They have to see that positivity, lads, because... You know, you, you uh, in particular there when you go to the likes of uh, Tipperary, Roscommon, Wicklow. Uh, in Roscommon in particular, you know, you had to get out of that car and you had to you had to have a real buzz in you. So I never trained as hard as I did actually at that time uh, myself personally. Okay, right. So what would you do to keep yourself in shape? Well, I I bike actually. I had a great story about about a guy Sean Whitney. I wanted to lose a pound or, well, we call okay, I'd be fair, a stone or two. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, no, he said to me, he says, uh, Johnny, he says, you can be cycling all you like, he says, but if you don't put in a few hills into it, number one. And when he told me to drop the back tyre, the pressure of the back tyre to about 45 or 50, ah, oh, jeez, it nearly wrecked my head. <laughs> so I did it for about, and when you're looking down at a fairly soft back tyre, I'll tell you something, you know, it does, it does, but what he was looking for is that uh, your mental uh, drive, your mental capacity, your endurance, um, your 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 defiance, I suppose. And I did that for about three or four weeks and made a man of me, I'll tell you that much. And uh, <laughs> pumped the tyre and away I went. But yeah, I would do about maybe 30 kilometres uh, on a run. Uh, a lot of hills around Kerry here, you know. And by God, yeah. I tell you, as you go on in the championship in the league, you know, you... The, the trick is, and he said this as well, put an extra hill into your run. This time with the pump tyre, of course. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, John, what, what have you made of the Football League so far this year? Kerry, they've obviously started to climb up the, the table at this stage, but she's Mayo are flying. Like, they've two yeah. draws, four wins. They're true to the final. Mayo are in the, are in the league final, and uh, what do you call it, and they've been very, very impressive. Really impressive. I, I, you know, they're... Again, I spoke earlier there about energy and, and vitality. And you talked with the loss of Keegan and Mullen. 
that you'd say to yourself, these boys are gone for a while now. But the opposite has happened, is that they've found players and, uh, you know, that they, they, they've got a huge energy going. The trick is now, though, and I, 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 it's interesting to see how they work it, is that they go to a league final and a week later they're out in, uh, in against uh, Roscommon, who aren't too... Who aren't too bad either now at the moment, um, but uh, and then two weeks later, if if they win, if they be, get over Ross Common, they 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 play Galway. That's a tricky couple of fences to jump at, uh, three fences to jump, and hope you'll come out on the other side. John, can I just ask you about that? Is it is there not something a bit fundamentally wrong with our competitions where the teams that potentially get to a final are almost been punished in some respect as regards the gap between games surely that's kind of fundamentally wrong like winners should always be incentivized and winning should always be incentivized absolutely and i think it's going to be very look there is no doubt about it it is flawed when you have a team that has to go out a week later i mean um roscommon if if they don't get to a final will be spanking their lips they'll be able to prepare so well so hard have a good look at mayo in a league final counteract him and Davy Burke will be spanking his lips saying uh, look hey we have to cover this this and this and and, and it gives them a huge advantage and it, right a national league title is one thing but like you say a team shouldn't be punished for that whereas if Kerry get there for instance uh, they have uh, three to four weeks and they have to come up against uh, is it Tip and um, Tip Waterford. and Lim no, sorry, Waterford and I mean Jack O'Connor, I think, is going to start pushing for a league final uh, at the weekend because of that. Whereas Mayo have to tread lightly and hope they come injury free, uh, hope that the, that the game plan goes. And a loss there, you know, would certainly affect the having had a wonderful league. A loss in a league final now could really throw a span on the works uh, for Mayo on, in their resurgence. So Galway only need a draw at home to carry this weekend to qualify for the league final against um, against Mayo. What has what have been the positives and the negatives that you've seen so far of Kerry this year? Well, I'll tell you. Up to about two weeks ago, I would have said this Kerry team isn't doing that much really. Like you know, I, the, I are they tired? Are the two Cliffords tired? The Shawnee Shea not taking freeze from the ground? Is there something up with his hip? But then. In the last two rounds, we've seen a big, big change. A big change. Now, the only downside of that is O'Kunbar got injured. But you had Donald Danos, Donald Down O'Sullivan. As after, no doubt about it, he is in the pick, picking order. The switch around that Jack Connor has done with Tony Brosnan is brilliant. Brilliant. He has now got his confidence back because he was the best shooter in Kerry for the last four or five years, no doubt about it. And... Um, you know, you've, you've Barry Dan, as I said, you've you've Barry Dan in at midfield. What has happened there with Kerry is that they've found a few players. As well as that, you have Gavin White back now, and you also you also have uh, Dermot O'Connor back. See, it was that's when you look at that, that's seven players that he's got back that are now fighting for position. Uh, whereas I would have been, I won't say critical of Kerry, but I was wondering why are they going. I think they're going to fire everything at Galway the next day and they're going to love being in a league final because they'll have that four or five week rest. So Kerry, Kerry on the one hand, have been slow starters. Mayo have been firing with all guns and rightly so. They've instilled confidence in their team. Nothing wrong with what they've done. But the way, as you said, the way the, the, the league is structured with the championship and the roll into the championship it's a lot of games, a lot of fences to jump. In fact, I would say there's two or three um, Beecher's Brooks there. No. <laughs> Is it, what, what, what have they done differently with Tony Brosnan? What's changed there? Well, he was coming on and he was supposed to be at the finish of, of each move. And for some reason or another, don't know why, um, he, he, it wasn't exactly happening. So what they did, cleverly enough, the, the management moved him out the field, let him be the provider. And now that he's the provider, he's giving brilliant ball in, got his confidence back. But hey, presto, what's he doing now? He's popping up the finish. So there's a bit more of a development game after coming back in and he's fitting, it, fitting into it 
beautifully. And now they're they're absolutely dead sure that put the ball in his hand left or right and he's going to pop it over the bar. Yeah, he, he def- he's almost... Jack Savage obviously left the squad, John, and he would have been playing that type of role maybe even in fits and starts before he left. But Brosnan is, is definitely flying now. Just wondering, a quick one for you, John. Like, was there any worry about how early the Cliffords came back uh, in the bigger in the bigger picture of things that they got very little of a break and maybe that they could be still fatigued maybe when they really wanted come June or July or was it a was a Matt did, did uh, Jack Connor as he said he always never there did, did Jack Connor did he feel like he needed to bring them back to potentially you know make sure to stay up in Division One and maybe potentially push on to a league final it's a bit it's a difficult kind of balancing act there. It is, and you're after you're after mentioning it there yourself. It, it's just a sort of a slow progress. And he gave them three weeks. I think he gave uh, uh, David four weeks and De- and Hardy three weeks. But these are footballers. They're they're mad to play. You know, they 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 just want to play. They they want to keep playing. And they're at a level of fitness where they were only, I suppose, humming along I, I, for the for the want of a word and. You know, I suppose you're part. They're part of it. One thing I'm getting from from them and and, and their friends and surrounds is that they're really enjoying the setup. They're I and mean, in place t- time. You're enjoying the setup. You're enjoying your role. You're enjoying the crack with the lads. You're enjoying being with the group. Then look, where do you want to be? No matter if you're tired or whether you've you've rakes of energy, it doesn't matter. You want to be with the group. And, that, you know, I suppose that's the answer, really. It's hard to hold those lads back sometimes, isn't it? Because you are trying to think of the bigger picture. But if, sometimes if lads want to play, you kind of have to, you kind of have to marry maybe what, with what you think they should do with what they actually want to do as well. But this is where I think a good co- a good uh, trainers, S&Cs and stuff like that, and physios, that they're, the best treatment you're going to get is inside with the group whether you're doing the runs or the laps or whatever you're doing, I don't think they're doing that much, to be quite honest with you. The rest of the team are doing a lot. And it's a, mat- mat- a matter of matching that, uh, timing uh, timing their training, uh, how much they do, how much they're loading they get. And in fact, unloading them maybe at times, you know. So, um, look, they want to be in there. I know that that's a fact. And they were, they were gagged to get back in. Uh, so look, it's a it's a win win anyway for for uh, the Ker- for Kerry and the management team. I I think. Yeah, go, so uh, go but you're Kerry. right. There was a worry. There was a worry when they did come back. You are right. So Galway Kerry this weekend. It's repeatedly all Ireland last year, and I'm sure Galway would love to lay down a marker. They haven't beaten Kerry since <laughs> 2018, but they would love to to get one over on Kerry, surely. Ah, uh, they would. Yeah, but. <sighs> Look, Potter Joyce is in his what third year now at this stage of going in. The, at least is it third or fourth? Fourth, fourth, I'd say, yeah, yeah. I think he's a lot shrewder now, and his 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 priority. He's done his bit for 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 the league, like you know. Uh, I don't know. Do they need to be going at each other? I I mean, if I was looking at it objectively, I would say that Potter Joyce will not be going hammer and tongs for this weekend and uh, beating Kerry. In, in above and above in Galway is not going to be the priority where he'll want to beat them is in Crow Park and I think uh, that's my reading of it I, I, I could be totally wrong I, if I was in Padraig Joyce's boots anyway certainly uh, I would say hey I need to get a block of training here I'm gifted and I mean gifted four weeks now so let's use that four weeks for to see who comes out uh, bandage br- bl- bloodied and bruised from the Roscommon uh, Mayo game and uh, let me be the clever guy and hold my powder dry until until then. And speaking of Roscommon, of course, you're a former manager. They're up against Donegal this weekend. Um, what have you made of Davy Burks? Uh, like, he was the last manager to be appointed. Paddy Carr, who was the second last manager to be appointed, has now left the Donegal post, which is, you know, the, the form hasn't been good. They are relegated. But geez, that's no, quite I- a change after just six games. It's huge, yeah. I suppose Donegal. Look, there's a lot of lot of uh, a lot of Carl Lacey issue is, is is in there somewhere in the mix. Uh, uh, I think the two lads now have been appointed uh, to what, what's the name, Paddy Bradley and and uh, O'Rourke. O'Rourke. Yeah, yeah, no, O'Rourke. They've been appointed as uh, as uh, the interim managers. Um, look, when you when I don't know too much about what's going on in, in Donegal. Um, you know, it's hard to comment on it, but 
you know, there's a lot of noise coming out of there. But on the two managers, certainly Davy Burke is the man that's singing, singing, Dick, uh, singing Dixie, as they say. You know, he's <laughs> he's um, he's he's talking up the team well, and uh, they're responding well. I'm just wondering, um, you know, that they, they, they have the forwards. I, they lost Connor Daly there in the previous second last game, and it's a big, big loss to them. Um, I think Kerry Kerry wasn't going full tilt with them, and but Roscommon did put up a good battle. They stayed in the game. They have good forwards, and I think they're they are a couple of notches up on what they were under da- uh, under Davy Burke. They have improved. There's a lot of uh, organisation in them, and uh, look, they have when you have two Murtas there and Inda Smith and Donny Smith and these guys Cox, Jesus. You you have great forwards. It's defensively I'd worry about them. They're, I think they're a small bit light, uh, mm. you know, for handling the likes of a uh, power power packed uh, Mayo. I think they'll have the, they'll they'll have their work cut out there. But Davy mm. Burke is doing a very good job at the moment, anyway. Yeah, and they have I'm a like... handy they have a handy round against Donegal if Donegal, Donegal, with Donegal in complete disarray. Yeah, would you expect it to be a, a fairly patchwork Donegal this weekend? Like the injuries, even Oshin Gallen going off the last day, Paddy McBearty, and of course uh, Michael Murphy has retired. So, like, what can we expect from Donegal from here on out in the season? Even I don't think that much. I mean, it, it certainly when when you lose when you lose a, a manager, um, they weren't playing well anyway. Number one, they, they weren't playing well. They had a good first round against Kerry. They won the game. They showed great uh, resilience. They showed great um, appetite, and it was downhill from there. And look, I suppose that everybody is saying they're a team in transition. And without Michael Murphy, a leader, and Paddy McBrearty, then the captain for 2023, gone. My God, so that's that's a blow. That's there's your two um, leaders gone, and and then as you say, Oshin Gallen again. So look. Um, they're, they're dropping like flies, but and when the manager starts dropping, I, t- I think they'll be in disarray for the rest of the, week, the year, to be quite honest with you. Yeah. Tyrone are playing Armagh this weekend. Like, Do you think Armagh are, are up there as a challenger? And I suppose Tyrone as well, after a poor start to the league and last year not defending Sam Maguire particularly impressively. Like, Are either of these teams real contenders this year? Look, I've seen a lot of teams try to play defensively. I've seen a lot of teams trying to, to do... Uh, a mimic of Tyrone. But by Jesus, I'll tell you, Tyrone are the team that can play defensively and attacking football and do it with the timing and expertise of when Mickey Hart was there. They've learned it. It's sort of ingrained into them. They worked so hard. And against Kerry, they were, they, I thought they were fantastic. They're, to me, they're the most improved team along with Mayo. No, no doubt about it. They're a danger because at any given time, at any given time, these guys can put it up to you. And, you know, there's still a few fellas to come to, to come back in, like, you know, there are two midfielders are back in, popping up at full forward, kicking points. Their strategy is brilliant, you know, they can, if you put up a defence against them with a man six foot four that will win full forward, pick off a point or two, back out, other midfielder goes in, you know, and we're still, and they're still without, uh, Matty Donnelly came back there and was absolutely flying. And uh, what's their former full forward? Um, McShane. He McShane. He hasn't fired at all yet, like, you know. So, look, their forwards, they can score. And, you know, the two Canavans, now you have Rory. Rory after coming in now, and he's kicking pints and kicking frees and whatnot. So, everybody is trying to mimic a Tyrone effort. But there's only one crowd that can do it, and that's Tyrone. And even Kerry trying to do it are poor at it. You know, so uh, to me, Tyrone, you can't write them off. Armagh have been a disappointment, no doubt about it. I think they're trying to do too much with Reen O'Neill. He's trying to be at full forward, centre forward, and mother of God, he's back in the square, then defending. You know, they, they, they have to, they have to identify where what his role is because he's a wonderful, wonderful footballer. He's a man mountain in his own athletic uh, build and everything, but. Uh, God, he's he's uh, you got to keep him up there because he's the score. He's a scorer. I know Stephen Campbell and a couple of more of those guys can 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 score, but he's the man. 
You know, there's a lot and, of lads. John, there's a lot of lads, John. You'd say they're playing everywhere for Armagh, but they're not playing anywhere. If you get me, like to me, Reen O'Neill is probably uh, number eleven, and you kind of build your forward line around him. Whereas it's same with Stephen Campbell. He's like dropping ridiculously deep at times. Like, and that's hard to maintain throughout a game if you're trying to be at one end of the pitch and trying to be at the other end of the pitch, particularly trying to kick scores at the other end of the pitch. And they've been kind of mixing and matching throughout the league. And it's, I don't know, the the changes they've made have kind of, I don't know nearly re- resembled what's happened on the pitch. It's been kind of patchy and they don't seem to have any great consistency to them. I agree with you and uh, uh, for, uh, no doubt about it. It's just that they're, they're a mix and match at the moment that's not that's not mixing properly. We'll put it like that. Um, they're, they're against Kerry, uh, their full-back scored, their corner-back scored, their wing-back scored. You know, look, that's fine. I have no problem with that. But their forwards weren't scoring at all. You know, and you look back on Reno O'Neill, and I would say he got a point the last in the last game. He, if this is from play, and I, I think he got, he got um, uh, maybe another point or two in the previous game. What I'm saying there is that the the, the, the power has gone out, the scoring power has gone from from Armagh, and I think that makes them very vulnerable. Mm. And just to go to Division 2, the big game of the weekend there is Dublin against Loud because Derry are already qualified. This is a straight shootout to see who goes up, who gets into the league final, but also gets promoted to Division 1. Like, Loud's, the way they've gone through the ranks under Mickey Hart, it's been quite incredible. So it's at Croke Park. It's a huge step up for them, even though they, they were in a league final there last year. So it's not completely unknown to them. But number one, what, what have you made of Loud? And then we'll come to Dublin just after it. Ah, uh, look, Loud, Loud have been, uh, I suppose, they've been ri- uh, rise. Now, I do have some relatives up in Loud, and they tell me that they've been quite lucky in a couple of games. However, they look, uh, they rode their luck against Cork the last day as well. Uh, but they, they had a good win against me now. And uh, so they have come a long, long way. And uh, when you're, they seem to rise their tempo, Mickey Hart has certainly put it in into them when they go playing the neighbours, we'll call it. <laughs> But uh, the Dublin uh, will be, a, I, I think, would be a stretch too far. Uh, Cork should have put them away, apparently. This is a Loutman telling me that, uh, as well as what I read about it, is that uh, Cork should have put them away in the first 26 minutes, had plenty of chances and didn't. Uh, so, and, and, and they're playing a tight defence. Uh, the whole thing switched in and uh, the Cork didn't uh, do what they're supposed to do. And... Uh, were very, very disappointing and Loud took full advantage. Against Dublin, no, I don't see them. I think if they keep Dublin, to be quite honest with you, and no disrespect to Mickey Hart and the Loud team, I think if they keep it to seven points, they'll be doing very, very well. Mm. It's quite incredible that Mickey Hart, he's, I think, 71 years of age and he's, you know, he's still kind of making waves, going all the way from Division 4, 3, 2 and possibly up to 1 if they do pretty much the unthinkable this weekend. I mean, it just shows that you don't necessarily need to be, you know, 35-year-old manager with, you know, the GPSs and all that kind of stuff. Now, maybe he used the technology, but, like, there's still a place for a man who's got that experience. Well, look, it, it, Mickey Hart is no fool. You know, he's, he hasn't won what he has won, and he is a very um, modern-thinking man uh, in so far as uh, that he does use all the scientific uh, sci- um Instruments, sciences, you name it. He is a brilliant GP, uh, sorry, um, SNC guys around him. He's a good management team. He's very astute in what he does. And the, the big thing, I suppose, that what's the obvious thing is that the players believe in him. They believe in what he's doing in his system. And whether you're 25, 35, or 65, or 75, once you the team believes in the system that they're all playing, and they all uh, work towards that's that's unstoppable. You know, you can do anything at, at that stage. And fair play to him from going from four to three to two to one, to, well, to, to maybe to one. Um, and they lo- they have lost a couple of very good players along the route as well. You know, so these challenges have been there, but they have believed in what Mickey's heart has been doing with them, and it's got him thus far. But thus far, I think, and no more. Just yeah, on what here- John says there, Shane, like here on Burn. Doing the cruise shit early in the year. Sam yeah. Mulroy, Sam Mulroy in probably round three, I think, ruled out for the rest of the league. Like, it probably hasn't been unbelievably pretty in the last couple of games, but they've managed to win games against big teams despite being without their two 
biggest players. And just from chatting biggest to, players, yeah. yeah, just from chatting to people who are at some of the games, by all accounts, like the most well, one of the most well drilled sides in the country. If you're to, I was chatting to somebody that was at the game against Cork and just said, if you wanted to see like the definition of well drilled, everybody knows what they have to do, regardless of who's missing. The thing just can kind of continues on. Uh, even James Calliff playing in the goals and out, you know, feeling kick, feeling kickouts from the opposition goalkeeper. If they are thinking about it a bit differently, and uh, listen, they probably are going to be under pressure against Dublin at the weekend, but shouldn't take away from the rise that they've made if you look at it like they came up with Limerick last year Limerick are you know down and you know down pretty badly and have changed managers throughout the league whereas Loud are up the, the la- you know the other end and within you know within a, a victory away from being promoted which would be unbelievable John, it, like, it is go on, sorry go ahead no I was going to I was going to ask you about Dublin actually do you think they're a better or a worse team than what you saw last year much better much much yeah. better yeah, I, I do. I, I just think that Dublin, you know, people, they can often say, oh, they're gone and they're old and I've heard all that. But, you know, they, 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 they've um, a simple little thing. We'll just take one of their iconic leaders, Brian Finton. He was playing poorly at the start of the league, uh, you know, and you start to say, well, has he got the appetite for it and one to another? The last two, two games, like, I mean, three games, he has been outstanding, absolutely outstanding. You know, Jack McCaffrey has played a couple of games. He did a few cameo roles, really, and come in and showed what he's capable of doing. You know, uh, th- these guys, these guys can can. Uh, your own merchant has played only a bit, I suppose. Uh, you know, but the James McCarthy, Finton, Castellan, Kilkenny, Connor Callahan is a guy that's after improving immensely now. I think they're getting what you call it a a bit of game time into their into their their, their team, and of course. This new guy, Killian O'Gara, has certainly, certainly lit the place up. And he's a nice left leg in him. And he's popping ball over the bar. He's linking well. He's a big guy. Different type of animal from what they had before. And, uh, you know, you can say Kilkenny and Dean Rock, all these guys, they've played a lot of football. But I think they're improving immensely, to be quite honest with you. I, 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 I'm impressed by them. I'm impressed yeah. by them. I think, I think they're doing what they have to do. And... Um, Again, look, they they put away meat so handily, and 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 I will say, you know, I know the tactics by meat looked terrible at the time, but their the meat energy was brilliant. They moved the ball fantastically, not not into the right areas, but they, 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 I think their game plan was poor, to be quite honest. You, but um, Dublin just dealt with it very very easily. I thought, you know, so I I think they're going to be a team when they get everybody together. And uh, they're timing their run. I think they're they're going to be a, they're going to be a force, no doubt about it. What have you made of of Colm O'Rourke's season? So obviously he's on RT in the Sunday game for years, and he's commented about teams and analysing teams, and like he's done it at club level in terms of like Simonstown. He won a couple of county titles with them in recent years. But now, is there sort of a cold hard reality that hits you, like that you, when you go from an analyst and you're looking at it and you've time to analyse it, and then now you're out there in the white heat, you're on the line. There's chaos of 30 players milling around in front of you. It's, it's very, very different to analysing it coldly in a studio when, you know, you're not emotionally involved. Of course it is. It's, it's very, very easy to analyse from the sideline. Like, we've seen a number of people try that. But with Colm, I think, look, uh, Cora, Cora Stanton, I think, uh, uh, a good footballer, female footballer, uh, Lady footballer, she she put, hit the nail in the head. Like I mean, you're playing a, against the wind and you're playing kick on football. You're running, uh, running, and you're playing man to man. You know, look that day, that day is gone. If you did it for half the game uh, and switch switch back to whatever you wanted, then after that maybe you'd have some chance. But God, they, they, they were very, really exposed. Like I mean, when they were playing against the wind and kicking the ball and losing the ball, I think they lost the ball somewhere in excess of 17 times in in the in the first half and i mean that's if you lose a ball if you if you look i'm not going to go into the stats of it but i think column has is has got maybe to listen to 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 the people around him more and they've got something have to change their plan now they don't have terribly poor players so there was a huge lot of 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 pace in them uh, there was, but it just seemed to the game plan it wasn't certainly working anywhere, and their defence was wide open. Mm. Uh, Michael, 
Yeah, John, I, we just, might just chat briefly about Division Three. I know you have to go. You have to go in a couple of minutes, but it, it's impossible to talk about Division Three without without talking about, I suppose, the situation that Offaly are in at the moment and the, the sad passing of, of Liam Kearns, who I know you you were very close with, uh, and he was involved with you in Ross Common. Um, can you just can you just give me your, your memories, of Liam? I know he's a man you had a great time for. Well, I suppose. Uh, look. Uh... I, I, he was an adversary, first of mine, and, and a fairly staunch uh, adversary. He played for the Stacks, like, you know, and by God, he, the Stacks uh, were a team that uh, Lone Rangers and ourselves, we we didn't think, we, we respected each other. When we went at it, we went at it hammer and tongs, like, you know. And Liam was at the centre uh, center field there uh, for, for the Stacks and played in the, uh, up centre forward at times. But he, he was a powerhouse there at midfield. And he carried that through to his 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 uh, his uh, managerial skills, and um, he, all his teams were very very um, they were very aggressive. Um, uh, if that's the right word, when I say aggressive, now they were they, they they went at it with such tenacity. They went at it with such endeavour. They went at it. They they got a huge lot of blocks in, and uh, and tactically he was he was very astute, very astute. He prided himself on the number of of matchups he'd get right. Um, he, he prided himself in the in the the opposition, finding weakness in the opposition. And you know, he he's uh, he, he was a very driven man. Like you know, and uh, he would ring me, lads, and 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 um, we we'll say he'd be he would be in the gym, and he'd be coming off the treadmill or going on the bike, and he'd be having a sup of water for four or five minutes. And he'd be hopping an idea of of what what he wanted to do off of somebody, or uh, if it was opposition, that well, what do you think of this guy? What's he, you know? Because we were both managers of, we call them uh, um, lesser teams or weaker teams or so-called weaker teams. Um, he was striving to bring teams out of Division Four, like I was, out of three, out of two, and try and get them up to one. <clears throat> and he loved the position he was in at the moment with Waffley. He absolutely loved it. He thought there was huge, huge uh, potential there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Even though they were missing nine to ten players that, through travel, through injury, through one thing and another. But he was saying it was about uh, settling them in into the into Division uh, 2 at the moment, or 3, sorry. And uh, he was going to be hoping to kick on. No, he was having a look at the championship. He was having a look at maybe, I think it's Longford they were playing, and, uh, and maybe they still will. But, you know, uh, it's, it's, a sad, it's a sad day for the young team. And the one thing that struck me, I, 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 I think it's very poignant to say this, I looked at the Guard of Honour and I looked at it in detail outside the church, uh, uh, what you call it, uh, as Liam was being brought in and out. God, they're young. God, they're young lads. They're so young. Uh, I spoke to Anton Sullivan briefly. You know, he'd be maybe around 30, something like that. Uh, but they're such, they're like babies, be quite honest with you. And I think that was the exact, the exact thing that Liam wanted. He wanted young lads putting, instilling confidence into them, getting them all working to the same plan. And that's what he was so excited about. And uh, he'll be a huge, huge loss, obviously. And, you know, I've paid tribute to his wife and the two girls, Rachel and Laura already. And But he's going to be a huge loss to Offaly. And I, I, just, I just think that, uh, you know, Offaly will remember, they'll remember his words. They'll remember what he was looking for and what he was demanding of them. And I hope if they carry that forward, they stand a great chance of uh, carry, having a good... A good uh, I suppose sporting Pat. Mm, like I spent an evening with him last summer and, and his wife as well, and just, he's great. He was, he was just great fun and great company. Mm. I sure gone up in the car in Roscommon. My God, just, no, we we spoke about um, um, about uh, the, the Roscommon and the opposition and that, but we had great. Absolutely, he enjoyed life and he enjoyed the crack and he liked mixing in with the lads at the right time and. Uh, he didn't let his guard down too often, though. I'll tell you that much. He 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 did it at the right time when it was when the reward was needed. No better man than Liam Cairns, uh, Lord of mercy in him. Um, 
uh, to to come up with the goods and get, get, have the right atmosphere and an old sing song thrown into it and stuff like that. Like you know, he's he was bang on for it, no problem. Yeah, I, I sure. suppose I suppose you know uh, he he. Uh, I was always hoping I, I didn't, you know, that he would be he'd hit a division one team along the line and take them and see where it would take him. Because he often said, you know, Johnny says these these managers that are in the training the coaching division one teams, they don't realize how tough it is trying to find players go out and convince them, bring them in, train them, coach them, and uh, you have to have an eye for talent uh, when you're down the divisions of four, three, four and three, anyway. Mm. So, uh, great guy, great guy. Yeah. Well, look, John, we really appreciate you joining us and giving your thoughts on the football and, of course, Liam as well. So, thank you very much, and we'll hopefully we'll be chatting again soon. Lovely, always to talk to you, lads. Uh, what you call it? Have a good day. All right, Cheers, John. Yes, Thanks, man. She's great memories there from from John and getting that insight on Liam. Fantastic stuff. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, it's, it's different when you've spent that much time with a fella going up and down the car and chatting about different things. And I, I do think that's interesting what he said that Liam kind of said about like when you're down the divisions, you have to eek to get every bit of talent you can find. You have to look really closely, a lot of unpolished gems. Whereas maybe up in a lot of the Division One counties, you can just, you know, your pick is quite plentiful, oh. isn't it? Really, like, you know what I mean? You're, you're overflowing in riches almost. Yeah, I mean, like, think of it like when he was with Tipperary. It's Stephen O'Brien taken off him by the hurlers. I mean, obviously it's Stephen O'Brien's choice, like, but you, you get the point that I'm trying to make. Yeah. If you were over like the Dublin footballers, you never have to worry about that. If you're over the Kerry footballers, it's just not a concern that you're ever going to have. Um, we just finish off talking about the game this weekend between Kilkenny and Cork. Like Kilkenny's form, to some in some respects, it's been decent. And eking out a win at home against Waterford the last day was impressive because they weren't fully flowing throughout the game. And but before that, poor against Tipperary. Obviously, they, they made a bit of a burst in the second half, but 12 points down at half time, not ideal. Weaker side of the draw and all that. Do we have a clue where Kilkenny are at this year? Not really. Uh, not really. Like, um, I was going to ask who's going to be centre back, but I assume when Richie Reid is going to be centre back. I think the two wing back slots will be, will be, new, will be new players in Blanchfield, who, from, from what I've seen of him, and even the last day was good. And you know what? He's. Um, He's not taking on shots anymore as well, which I've noticed, which is maybe come summertime he will when you can open, open up your shoulders a bit more with a, maybe a drier ball. But he's generally trying to feed the full forward line. And I think that's that's one thing I have noticed with, with Derek Ling's Kilkenny, that maybe shooting from out the field has been maybe a bit less than, you know, under the previous regime. They are really trying to pepper ball to the inside line and give favourable ball into the forwards. But like I, I, like, I could pick most of the team whereabouts they'll be playing I, you know you couldn't really be sure I'm not sure if Owen Murphy's going to be fit for the weekend as well he wasn't listed in the squad last weekend after coming off injured against Dublin uh, very much doubt we'd see TJ we've had what have we had we've had two squads he's been in the last two squads Richie Hogan hasn't we haven't seen him yet which is kind of interesting in itself. But the fact that he's making the squads is very positive because he hadn't made a league squad last year. So he could appear at the weekend as well. I, c I couldn't tell you where I think Keen Kenny is going to play this year. So he's I, at, at the moment, Shane, I don't know if he'd be playing at all, to yeah, be honest. Like, you look at the you know recent times. Last year against Dublin, he played as like named corner forward, but he was drifting out a little bit. We've seen him straight up play midfield in an All-Ireland final. More recently, we've, like we've seen him in the half forward line before. And most recently, we've seen him play wing back and been taken off early, I think, two games in a row. And I know there's some frustration in Kilkenny and locally around the village. You know, what are you doing playing in wing back? So, uh, but you'd imagine that the idea is he's, he's kind of like a deep line playmaker. Now, I don't know how suited he is to man marking as well as that. Yeah, well, if he played yeah. centre back for the village in a county final, I don't think it's that big of a departure to say that he could, that he was slot in wing back for Kilkenny. Whether it's his best position or not, I don't think it is. Yeah, but like, Surely he's a player to have to make sure that they find a role for him because, like, Kilkenny have lots of, like, some, you know, some super talented players like Adrian Mullen, obviously TJ Reid, there's Parik Walsh and so on and so forth. But, like, there's a certain amount of players that they have that are workhorses, but they need to kind of mix and match it with a little bit of magic. Like, he has a little bit of magic. I know too often he goes into contact, throws the arms up in the air looking for freeze, but, like, he does have a lot of talent. Yeah, no, he's got plenty of talent, all right. Um... I thought he'd filled out a bit as well, maybe compared to last year. Um, I, I, and maybe 
you know, you don't want to pigeonhole a player, but he, he does look like a bit more of a top of the ground type player. So you mm. imagine, you imagine he'd excel a bit more uh, come kind of May June if they're if they're still in the equation at that stage. But yeah, you wouldn't be a hundred percent sure where exact. Oh, and Cody would play somewhere in the forward line. You wouldn't be exactly sure where. You'd still be confident enough that TJ would probably be out number eleven. Adrian Mullen would be drifting from the wing to midfield whenever he gets back. It's been a while now since he since he's played. He hasn't played since. Uh, what a challenge game between the All Ireland club semi final and final. And that's quite a while ago. We're on two months now at this stage, I'd say. So it was obviously quite a bad uh, hamstring injury that he was that he was carrying. Uh, it's funny actually. He was that good for Ballyhale that he got nominated for club hurler of the year despite missing the club final, which is something else. And I'm just thinking about those club awards as well. Uh, I don't think it's ever happened before that someone's got a Hurler of the Year award and there's a distinct possibility that they might never hurl at that level again. Do you know what I mean? With, with Joey Holden gone travelling or whatever. So if, if he doesn't play for Ballyhale again, he's going travelling for a couple of years. That's the way to finish out your club career. Um, so give me your prediction for Cork against Kilkenny. John Myler, or was it John Myler said that they would win there in Cork? Or sorry, yeah, in... Y- uh, I could have said it as well. I think Cork will win. Oh, maybe it was you that said it. Just because um, I wouldn't be 100% sure with Kil- 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 Kilkenny are at at the moment. And if you look at it, Cork have to be at the pitch very, very soon for Munster. Kilkenny don't really have to be. Cork wouldn't be reintroducing a player in the first round of Munster having not played at all. I don't think he'd be starting. Like Kilkenny probably will do with TJ. But they have that you know, maybe luxury where they're going to, barring Galway, Barring Galway, you'd fancy them to potentially to beat the rest of the teams even without maybe their main man. Just about, like. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, well, Wexford won in Nolan Park last year after having, you know, a disastrous end to the league. Yeah, no, but their, fair, their full league has been fairly poor this year. That's that's probably a bit different. Um, I just, yeah, I just, they're, they're kind of, Kilkenny and Cork are in two different positions at the moment. I think it probably, the need is probably greater for Cork and it would be, you. it would be a bit of a statement if they can go up to Kilkenny and win. So let's talk about. Uh, well, I think that Kilkenny are going to win this game. Let's uh, let's talk about the other semi final, Limerick against Tipperary. Go on, what's, against... what's your what's your basis for thinking Kilkenny are going to win? Because I, I do think that Cork are going to they're going to go there. They're going to look to you know they're a bunch of cheetahs and they're going to be dragged into a war. And I think they will struggle. And it'll be the same old way that they've lost to Kilkenny over the years. Now I know they beat them last year. Go on. Cheetahs is uh, cheetahs is an interesting way of describing them because you're kind of describing them uh, with you know a positive, but you're basically saying that the cheetahs are going to go to Kilkenny and just get totally dogged out of it essentially. And a cheetah is a cat, and they're going to play the cat. So <laughs> yeah, I, I could have worked this a little bit better. But like cheetahs are obviously very fast. They're known for it now. They're very on spring. A fair bit of <laughs> like toes. like, a, like a gazelle. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think Kilkenny will drag him into the war. You just think it's going to be war. bang, 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 bang. There'll be a lot of collisions and they maybe won't be able to express themselves as they normally would. Well, like I think f- like talent-wise, I think Cork have more talent than uh, Kilkenny, especially if the two times or the two teams were both full strength. I would say that um, Cork have more talent. But time and time again over the years, they've ended up going into one of these big matches and they've been dragged into the sort of game that they don't want to play. Like, they all are in the final a couple of years ago. Really different occasion to this. But they ended up getting dragged into a game where they were pumping long ball into Limerick numbers. And, you know, it was it was crazy. And I think that could end up happening in this game as well. We'll see. Will they get unnerved at, uh, at Nolan Park? To be fair, though, it's unfair to tarnish these players and Pat Ryan with that. But that would be my concern, that until we see it proven, you know, I'm going to say, okay, Kilkenny, I think they'll leak it out here. You, you've you almost taken my position, the Doubton the doubt Thomas position. I just think, they're, I think their form is a bit steadier than Kilkenny in the league. I just think they'll just about get the job done. But I still, no, I still think Cork have the talent to win in All-Ireland. It's just mm-hmm. I need to see a little bit more. You know, they keep failing this relatively the same sort of way. If they start doing things differently, like as they've done so far in the league, coming from behind, eking it out in low-scoring games against the likes of Wexford and so on, then I'll start to believe more. But it's just, I think this is this is exactly the sort of game that they tend to lose. Okay, uh, fair enough. But yeah, ma- fair ma- enough. maybe they'll prove us wrong here. Hey, before, uh, we move on to, before we move on to Limerick and Tip, we might just do a quick little quiz time. Is that okay? Oh, go for it, yeah. Perfect, yeah. So we have three questions, uh, all of a completely different variety. So there's no correlation, really, between the three of them. But the first question is, 
who won the 2020 Division One Hurling League final and who did they beat? So question one, who won the 2020 Division One Hurling League final and who did they beat? The oh. second question, yeah, the second question, I'll repeat the question at the end. The second question is to do with a jersey sponsor. So who are the current sponsors of the Mead Senior Footballers? So jersey sponsor question number two. Who are the jersey sponsors of the Mead Senior Footballers? And okay. I'd be amazed if anybody gets this without Googling. Who was the 2022 Puck Fada Hurling Champion? Okay. So, so who was the 2022 Puck Fada Hurling Champion? So three questions again. Who won the 2020 Division One Hurling League Final and who did they beat? Who 2020 the or 2021, sorry? 2020. Okay. Oh, wait, no, you're after confusing me now. No, 2020, yeah. Um, the other question, next one is, jersey sponsors, who sponsors the Mead Senior Footballers? And lastly, who was the 2022 Puck Fodda champion? And just while you're thinking there, I just need to check something here really quickly just to make sure that I haven't uh, that I haven't shot myself in the foot. I hope you're I a shambles. I, I hope I haven't. I don't, I don't think I have. You're just after making me question myself a small bit. So I'm just going to check. To make sure that I'm right and I am right, that's okay. Okay, uh, just to give our viewers a chance, get the, all three answers in together. We'll only accept the three answers together. TV Street says TJ Reid, Richie Hogan, Walter Walsh have a combined age of 100. Can you make up 100 years using three panel members from another county? Uh, Tipperary, Bonner Maher is probably 32. I'd James say Camden. James Callan is 34. And then Noel McGrath, 32. So that's about what, 97 or something like that? 97, yeah. 98, something uh, like that. Let me think. In Waterford, you couldn't. I don't. There's barely anybody at their in their thirties. Uh, in Kil Kilkenny, yeah, we've said Galway. Jesus, is barely at, like the Mannions are late twenties, thirty. Mark yeah. Connor Cooney, the same. Dotty Burke, the same. Grod McInerney. But Joseph same. Cooney, Joseph Cooney, and Grod McInerney are probably both in their thirties. It's very early, though. Like, yeah, to, to get to hundred, we're going to need. You know, a 35, a 33, and a 32. Yeah, fair, very fair. fair. It's an interesting question. Um, Antrim? I'd say Neil McManus must be 34. Is there any other players who are in their 30s? Not 30, not 33s, I wouldn't have thought. I think we're looking for a keeper somewhere, realistically. Uh, yeah. We're looking for an older keeper, but they're not exactly jumping out at me at the moment. Very, uh, very good question to get the mind working, I have to say. Yeah. P174, Limerick to be a lot fresher this weekend. They looked tired versus Wexford. Hegarty nearly crawled off when he was subbed. Okay, so my guesses are... the guesses. 2020. I love, I love the way you say guesses. They're not answers. Okay, my answers are... So the 2020 Division One League final. So this was... Lim it was Limerick, wasn't it? Because they won two in a row. Yeah. And was that the year that they beat Clare, which was doubled up as a monster opener? Very good. Didn't think you'd get that one because I kind of half forgotten until I checked it. Very good. Meath, isn't it Gordon Elliott? No, it's uh, it's the Becht of Stud Tea Rooms. They have horses. Becht of Stud have horses with Gordon Elliott. It's close. Gordon Elliott sponsors Summer Hill, but there's a connection. But it's uh, like it's a tenuous, it's a tenuous link. A half point. A quarter point. I'd say. Okay, we take a quarter and. I feel like it's somebody from Ulster that's the Puck Fada champion, but I'm going to go with Keelan Kiley because I can't think of a name for anyone who might No, be. I think he was third. It was a fella called Killian Phelan from Clara in Kilkenny. Okay. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, Richard Hogan says, uh, what the F is going on? St. Tip and Kilkenny and Vernie going against them. Yeah, your native county. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just think, I think Cork could get the job done this weekend, yeah, just about. Do you think there's going to be any shadow boxing when Limerick meets Tipperary this weekend? Honestly, I don't. I don't really like from a from a tip point of view. I think they've a lot to gain from putting in a really strong performance. Were they to get a win, I think it would be huge for them at this stage. Um, Limerick, outside of that, you know, the second half against Cork, maybe where they pulled off a good few players. I don't think there's been much shadow boxing going on from them really. I think they've been trying to win the games. I think they're a good bit ahead of where they were uh, last year, and I think that's by design. Uh, no, I don't. I don't think so. I, I think Tip will try and see potentially I know I mentioned it earlier on the week you know does Seamus Kennedy work potentially on Kyle Hayes if he's playing that half forward that's going to go up and down the flank kind of defending as well um, who maybe works on Dermot Burns who's going to stop 
uh, Dermot Burns from getting long shots away. Um, so I no, I don't think to be too much shadow boxing. I have to say, if we're, yeah. they're playing the first round, it might be different. But they're, I'm not sure what round they're playing in. But I think there's a lot to be benefited, for, particularly from a tip point of view, to go and try and get a win at the weekend. And it's not. I don't think it's in Cattle's nature to hold back anyway. And I, and I don't think last year's league will have any bearing on them holding back or anything either. I just think they they probably didn't uh, manage the gap between weeks or games two and three very well. And I'm sure that's something that he's put the finger on already to make sure it doesn't happen this year. Yeah, it's not like they played terribly against Limerick the first day. It's just they came up short, even though Limerick were down one or two. They still performed quite well. So, yeah, I agree. I think it was the gap to the next game that was the problem. Right, let's just bring it up on screen here. A bit of a tactics board. Now, this is based on Tipperary's... I mean, last week it was much changed against Antrim. So we've kind of, broadly speaking, gone with the team that played against um, Waterford in the previous game in Semple Stadium. And with Limerick, we've gone with... Pretty strong team here. It may or may not be exactly this team. Sean Finn isn't starting here in this team because I don't think he was playing last week, so no. I'm not entirely sure he'll play this week. But obviously he'd start if he's available. But it gave us a good way to just make sure that Casey and Dan Morrissey were starting without having to argue too much about it. So Mighty Breen has played fullback. He's also played on the wing. Owen Connolly has played in the full back line. He can also play, you know, he's been a centre back for the tip under 20s in recent years. But this is the big thing that I think is going that's going to be a standout feature. The two players that mark Seamus Flanagan and Aaron Galan. So whether they're out the field or in closer to goal. Now both Michael Breen and Brian O'Mara would be happy in the half back line. Or they, you could see them playing as the, a full back line. Cahill Barrett's obviously not available to mark Peter Casey, so I reckon it'll be Johnny Ryan. It could be Conor McCarthy or someone like that, depending on fitness. But I think that this is what the reason that Brian O'Mara and Michael Breen have been playing full back and alternating is basically to go 2v2 on these exact type of guys in matches that matter. I think it'll be Breen against Flanagan and Brian O'Mara against Galan, or the other way around. But I see this as being the 2v2, and I think it's very important heading into the summer. Oh, it is indeed. Yeah, you need to get that. You need to get that right. You need to make sure that you know there is going to be a good quality of all going into Galan and probably Flanagan inside, and you need to make sure that if you know if whoever they're marking is turned or whatever, that they're able to get back, and that they're able to. You have to be able to go to toe to, to, to toe with the two of them. And I think like Brian O'Mara played out in the half back lane against Leash. Um, he obviously played there for UL as well and was one of their best players. But he's kind of. Uh, John Milan described him to me as a Brendan Maher type player. He's very flexible, isn't he, with where he can play. He could play anywhere, really, probably between two and nine, I'd say. Um, and you need to have that flexibility. Even seeing Breen playing at stages wing back as well, that could be a potential sign of where, where he's going to play. Uh, come Limerick, maybe he'll... Could he maybe, match up with Hegarty? He, he, or he, he could, yeah. Like, he could. He definitely could. Um, that's And even, like, Seamus Kennedy was kind of listed at seven the last day, even though he's generally played that half-forward role. Um, and as I said to you the last week's show, like Cal will definitely try different things. Like he'd no issue with putting Prunty out wing back on on Hegarty because he thought he could go toe to toe with him in that Munster game last year. So everything a manager is doing, and definitely looking at Cal, everything he's doing is, yeah, it's with a view to long term and how we're going to go forward. But it's also with a view to how are we going to play against Limerick? How are we going to match up against X, Y, and Z? Uh, not sure if Keane Lynch is going to feature. He had a bit of a knock last weekend, so I wouldn't be that surprised if like they can put probably Cotton O'Neill in centre forward. Maybe if he if he doesn't play, they've got quite a bit of flexibility there as well. Uh, and you were saying as well, it's very unlikely that that Shane O'Brien or Adam English are going to feature with the with the new under twenties rule as well because I think they're playing. That's on Saturday as well. Now, yeah, right? against Watford. Yeah, so that's been changed as well. So uh, even the Clare Tipperary under-20 game. Now, there's no... I'm not sure... There, there wouldn't be any Tipperary players who'd be operating in both at the moment. But yeah, that would obviously preclude those guys if they're going to line out with the under-20s, which that seemed to be the plan anyway. But um, yeah, like Owen, Owen Connolly's a big man. He's six foot four. And whether he has the legs to keep up with Groot Hegarty is another thing. But like physically... There's a match up there that you think, well, potentially that could work if Seamus Kennedy isn't the one to come back, or maybe Seamus Kennedy comes across to Kyle Hayes. I mean, Alan Tynan is a fair machine of a guy um, to cover ground. So you can see that, like, that's a very industrious tip half forward line, isn't it, really? And Noel McGrath may or may not play there, but Groot O'Connor has been very impressive. And physically, in terms of thundering into these, uh, these Limerick backs, which Tipperary will want to be able to do, or at very least try and get close to breaking even. It's important to have lads like him. And then I've picked Bonner Maher 14 there. He may or may not start there. But again, the ball sh probably won't come out too handy if he's there. And then that's a real test for Mark Keogh, whether it's Sean Finn, Mike Casey, or Dan Morrissey, whoever's on him. 
huge huge uh thing there but barry nash cannot be allowed to dominate things for um for tipperary so i'm not saying necessarily that jake morris will be looking to pick him up or whatever or anything of that sort you know it'll be jake morris looking to drag him or whoever around the pitch but how do you set up for the puckouts if you're setting up the puckouts um against limerick short puckouts how do you set up do you make sure that like you want to drop off because you don't want to do what Limerick did or to Kilkenny in the All Ireland final, which is basically end up getting destroyed on the puckouts because you pushed up too far. But you don't want to necessarily drop off Barry Nash. You want to basically show them the sidelines, hem them down the shy sidelines, get tight to the men in the middle, and enforce them to drive it long. But it's just a very difficult thing to do against this Limerick team, isn't it? Yeah, well, Nash is probably not the what the last person you want to leave. Yeah, you don't want to leave Nash free. Finn is unbelievably comfortable as well. I'd say if you're talking about, like, if you if you want to make it as awkward as possible for them, if there's going to be a free puck out, you're probably maybe leaving, like, Dan Morrissey is probably the least comfortable, even though he is very comfortable on the ball, or maybe Mike Casey as well, who you wouldn't necessarily see on the ball. You don't want it, like, Nash is just so comfortable on the ball. Like, he just take the ball, he look up, and as I said to you on Monday's show, I've noticed, like, the second the, the ball, the, the first receiver, as I say, received the ball, he's not taking the four steps and generally going. It's almost like a stick pass, straight out of trouble. Again, kind of, they're, they're, they're kind of almost anticipating teams pushing up on that first man and getting the ball away really quickly and then maybe getting the ball away again. Um, So, I just, like, from a tip point of view, like, who would you, if, in an ideal world, who would you like to see Getting if been in that first receiver role for Limerick, if you're forcing somebody to take the ball, to me it would probably be Dan Morrissey. Um, that's just personal opinion. That's not to say he's not uncomfortable on the ball. I just think he's uh, he's less likely to maybe be as creative as a Nash or a Finn with the ball. I put it to you that way. And you know what? It's very interesting for because Liam Cahill has obviously come up against this Limerick team several times with Waterford, so he may have an idea of what does and doesn't work. I mean, that's not to say that. You know, it's worked for him because obviously they they were beaten every time by Limerick and by bigger margins. The more and more it went on, because obviously he got to that wasn't it the Munster final and they lost by four, four. or five. Eleven four. in the eleven in the All Ireland, wasn't it? And I think eleven then the semi final the year after, and then last year lost by was it maybe four or five as well? Three. I thought I think it was three. Was it twenty points three. to two twenty one or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they've had relative success. We'll put it that way. But at least he's kind of he's been there. He's tried to set the team up against them, so he has an idea of what may work. And I suppose conversely, then John Kiley has an idea of what Lean Cattle likes to do against his team. Now I'm going to go through a couple of comments here. Tip doesn't have a good midfield, says Fred ninety one. I'd say Connor Stakelin was one of Tipperary's most impressive players last year, and looks in serious form this year. I think he's a real dogged player um, who's <laughs> able to chip in with a couple of points as well. Does a lot of on scene work. Uh, yeah. Did a bit, did a bit of niggling against Watford too. <laughs> yeah, Limerick will start at least two or three of the new lads. I would think, though, maybe, maybe not. Uh, Leonard Tobin says important yardstick for Tip to see where they're at. Over overall conditioning looks vastly improved for them, and they've still got all the scoring capabilities. Porter Porter wonders, Rhys Shelley in goals? Well, he started the last two games. Barry Hogan started down in Nolan Park. We don't know. We're just kind of throwing it in based Shelley on the was Watford. injured as well after the Fitzgibbon. Remember that? Funny enough, yeah. Dean Mason was named in the Fitzgibbon team of the year despite only coming... Like, his first game, I think, was 15 minutes into the semi-final. But he was that good thereafter. But Shelley had been the keeper before that. Um... Uh, as well as that, just what, what one of the commenters there said about maybe Kylie turning in a new face. Like, Gunnick O'Donnell has been outstanding, you'd have to say. Like, maybe, maybe he'll give him, you know, he's had a start already. I think he got five points, didn't he, against Westmead. But maybe he'll throw him in against Tip and maybe not give them too much forewarning of what they're going to meet come summertime. And it's still a dangerous player who you're giving an opportunity to. Because if O'Brien and English are out of the equation, then he's probably next in the pecking order. He might do something like that. Because if it's the case, Kylie knows a lot about his squad. No, uh, no, okay, I'll put it this way. He knows a lot about his 17 or 18. And maybe he needs to learn a little bit more about the likes of a, an O'Dalig or maybe a Cottle O'Neill or something like that. Yeah, so TV Street says, Dan McCormick on Tom Morrissey. I don't know about that one. Again, we're just speculating based on some of the teams we've seen in recent times. So Dan McCormick played wing back give or take against Watford because he was picking up Austin Gleeson. So that shows that they have trust in him to man mark a fairly key guy, which Tom Morris he is. Now, whether the matchup works, that's another thing. I'm just sorry. I'm just after thinking with Dan McCormick. I had a great time for Dan as a player. But if we were doing a top five of lads that have an ability to win frees by going like this, 
I'd, we, we'll have to do it. We'll have to do it someday. Keen Kenny will be in there. Carrick Daly. Dan McCormack. Probably the king will be Parik Maher. Um, we'll, 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 we'll do it someday. We'll have a very good think about it, even though I don't know if uh, people will take too kindly to it. No. Leonard Tobin says, O'Connor's role is important to try and commit men to stop him and disrupt Limerick's shape and get narrow. Limerick keeping their shape has been a key pillar to their success. Now, fine, like... Tipperary have been accused of not having pace in recent years and, and what have you. In this team here now, and uh, I've said it already, I think this is a big test for Mark Keogh because he's shown some good form in the league. There's still times when what frustrates me is he puts the stick to a ball that he could just catch and sometimes spills it on that basis. There's some forwards who do that. Uh, like Jake Morris's pace, Alan Tynan has pace as well to run through the centre, draw a man and pop it off. Seamus Kendi has pace, but obviously he's not a native forward. So, like, do you like the mix of that Tipperary forward line? No, it mightn't be that necess- necessarily that forward line, but do you like the mix of what's what we're seeing there? Yeah, it's not a bad little mix. Um, I think Tynan brings a lot of physicality to it. This would be a this would be like the biggest test of his career by a country mile. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how he gets on. It's also Seamus Kennedy's role has been, I'd say, quite successful. But again, it's just you're going up a couple of levels here, aren't you? There's a potential for you know a Garoda Connor maybe to not get on a ball for 10 or 15 minutes or get on a ball and be overturned. And that's what kind of Limerick can do to you. So I think Tip are going to learn a hell of a lot about their team and about their squad in this game because what they're coming up against is up a couple of levels to what they've played so far. Yeah, and like we will find out if Tip are back this weekend. Like a heavy beaten would be the only massive concern for Tip. If Tipperary hurl well and Limerick pull away towards the end or whatever, I still think it's not the end of the world. If Tip win, obviously brilliant. But Limerick will want to grind Tipperary into the floor here, won't they? They'll want to say, hey, Tip, you've had a good little season now, you know, back into your box. Well, do you know what would be a bit of a disaster from a Tipperary point of view? A Tip team that's been flying throughout the league and, you know, Limerick are four or five up most of the game and grind them down and win by eight or nine. And it's kind of familiar failings shall we say that would be a bit that would be a bit demoralizing from a tip point of view but like there will i think there will be a sense of tip getting a bit of a reality check at different stages throughout the game um and we've talked about like i think limerick's best uh attribute by a mile is their ability to um kind of overcome various in-game things and how mm. tip because that will happen to tip at several stages on on Saturday afternoon and it's you know if Hayes is marauding up and down the wing and he's get after getting two points and he's after setting up a goal like how do they deal with that there and then not not you know in the video session after how do they deal with that there and then or have they got a ready made solution to take care of Hayes it, I just there's a lot of questions that are or a lot of answers are going to be posed to kind of tip at the weekend and it's going to be can they come up with something for you know for a remedy for what they're going to be thrown at because there's a lot going to be thrown at them more than what has been thrown at them so far and I think that's what's fascinating about it but you do have a tip team that's flying against the Limerick team that's you know flying in in their own in their own respect as well and I'm sure listen if Limerick are, are have gotten this far I'm sure they're going to try and push on and try and win a league at this stage um yeah because it just again it, it builds into the narrative of Oh, a Limerick team at seventy percent was able to win a league, and you know how are we going to beat them come championship? Do you know what I mean? You know what I mean? You yeah, yeah, of course. Doubt. You know when you have that doubt in the rest of the country's minds, basically, uh, they're basically you know living kind of rent free in most managers' minds and most players' minds at this stage, and that's you know you try and hold on to that as long as you can. Like Limerick are able to go into the last ten minutes of games that are very tight and feel like, look, we'll find a way over the line. We always do. I mean, that that's a brilliant thing yeah. when you can have that coolness out on the field, and they look like a team that definitely has it. I uh, just want to remind people that we've uh, launched a live club fundraiser. So we're going to be doing one in Rowan Moore in just under a month, so that's going to be brilliant. A great way to raise funds for your club for the year, and also we're brought to you by our store.ie, which is the home of the official merchandise for uh, our game. A few other comments coming in here uh, already. Flash, looking forward to the match Sunday. Interested to see how Tipperary under Cahill match up against us. Tip v Clare in the first round uh, is a match as a neutral that I'm really waiting for. They're going to kill each other. They are, aren't they? But this game, I think this is going to be skin and hair flying on Saturday night. Yeah, no, I think there will be as well. I think it's going to be, I mentioned it on Monday, I think it'll be a lot like the 2018 semi-final where the boot's on the other foot. I think Tip has something to prove. They're the, they're the up-and-coming team now. Limerick are the season team. Um, yeah, I'm expecting a rip-roaring game, I have to say. I'm expecting two good league semi-finals. I know the league hasn't... We've only, like, 
we could probably count on one hand the amount of really competitive games we've had so far and real meaningful games where you think teams are giving it everything. You know, I, I wouldn't expect I don't expect any shadow boxing really at the weekend. I think all four teams will go at it hammer and tongs. Yeah, um Jason Ford has two goals from play this year. Jake Morris has five, Connor Bow has three, John McGrath's come back, and like Connor Stakeland was asked in this little clip, it was like a QA with Tip GAA the other day, and he was asked who's the player to watch out for this year? And he said John McGrath. And it was just the, the manner that John McGrath set up that third goal for Jake Morris against Watford makes me think, okay, this lad's sharp again. The last few years haven't really been his best, but he's still got serious quality. So I'm wondering how he'll go this weekend. He got player of the week, I think, last weekend. Uh, off the back of a you know a meaningless enough game, he hit six points from play. As you said, uh, he was pro- you know he was he was okay against Leash first time out in what was his really his return game. He's kind of eased back in and looked like looks like he's finding a bit of form. But if you look at it, like and this it's a really satisfying thing from Cattle's point of view. A lot of tip players are in form. They look like they're in form, shall we say? Um, and it's one thing having a couple of players in form, but when you have a squad in form, they kind of think anything is possible. So I'm I'm looking forward to him getting stuck into Limerick and, uh, on Saturday. And I expect there to be plenty of niggle as well, particularly from a tip point of view, because like when was the last time Tip beat Limerick? There's a good one for you. Outside of that, like round that meaningless mount round robin game where Bonner and Barrett got injured. When was the last time is that league semi final the last time Tip beat Limerick in a meaningful game? Yeah, because the Tipperary beat Limerick in the league a couple of years ago in Turles. I think it was the day that Brian O'Mara broke his arm. They yeah, I think by a point, that, I think, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, that's twenty twenty one, but yeah, not overly meaningful. Other than that, the Tipperary play them in twenty seventeen. I'm trying to remember. It was like twenty sixteen. Tip won, you know, when Bubbles got sent off, but still won the game by four or five. Then the year after, Tip might have won by about sixteen points down in the yeah. Gaelic ground. But from then on, I remember, wasn't it twenty eighteen? Didn't Pat Ryan score a goal against Tip that, or was it Barry Murphy might have scored a goal that day? Um, Tip had made five changes coming into the game. All the talk was what's going on and all that kind of crack. But um, yeah, a few comments coming in here. Just the last <laughs> thing I'd say quickly, Shane, on that is they haven't beaten Kylie's Limerick really, if you get me, in a meaningful game. That's yeah. kind of what I'm saying. Yeah, you know? true, it's true, it's true. And I think John Kylie versus Liam uh, Cahill, that's the new managerial super bout that we're starting. We've seen it a few times in the last few years. Assuming Tip don't kind of fall off the wagon. This could be a great matchup for the next couple of years. Uh, Michael O'Keen says a tip win would add great spice to the championship. Too many already given uh, Limerick everything. Limerick City is going to be uh, wild crack Saturday night. Two big games all into the pub right after. Is there rugby on or something? Uh, I don't uh, know rugby on. Okay, it says, yeah. says there's rugby there. We have no idea because we absolutely do not care. Toman Park, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, no red cards and no injuries for Limerick. The majority of Limerick fans would be happy. Limerick beat Tip in 2013 and 14, and then Tip won handy in 2015 when Hennessy smashed into Callan. Do you remember yeah. his teeth went flying? Ooh, that was a little bit dog rough. Okay, right, keep your comments coming in. We'll read them in before the end of the show, but there's a very, very important game, arguably more important than the two semifinals, uh, between Westmead and Leash. That's at Semple Stadium on, is it Saturday at 2 p.m. or is it Sunday? Um, but that's a big one because the loser goes down to Division 2A for next year. Joe Fortune over the West Mead team, they've, you know, it hasn't been a great season for them so far. They're on a minus 78 score in difference, albeit on the tougher side of the league. Leash, they've found it t- the going very tough also, minus 63 score in difference after their five defeats. But there's a lot at stake here when uh, William Maher meets Joe uh, Fortune. Yeah, listen, if you're a manager of either of these teams, you're probably realistically, and I know... Them. Ah, they probably, you know, Joe Fortune would admit it anyway, that if you wanted to have your team primed for two games this year in particular, it would have been this game that they both realistically knew was coming down the tracks. And it would probably be, for, for Westmead anyway, it would be the Antrim game in Leinster. And for Leash, it would be, yeah, listen, it would probably be the Offaly game and maybe the Kerry game and the Joe McDonough and probably the Kildare game now at this stage, the whole campaign. But, uh, yeah, it's based on form and what we've seen so far. I would say Westmead have been uh, maybe a more competitive in a tougher division, and Leash have suffered that. They had to, it was basically a relegation semi final against Antrim. They were beaten by six points that day, um, and they started well. They started no. well. They, they generally they haven't. Like they haven't, they haven't stringed together. You know, they've played a couple of decent halves. They were okay against Tip in the second half. They were good against uh, Watford in the first half. 
when they had an extra man, but they haven't been able to string more than 40, 45 minutes together, realistically. Um, I, and Westmead obviously gave them that bit of a hiding in last year's Leinster relegation game as well. I think they hit them for five goals that night after it had been tight enough up until maybe half time or that. So I'd probably be favouring Westmead here. It is, it is it, like, in, you know what though? Like, it's a huge game for Westmead in one respect, but like, if they do win, is it any? If the league structure is not changed, is there any benefit to, you know, them going back in to that Group One A again next year? I genuinely don't think there is. I, I, I honestly think the league structure has to be looked at, particularly for that kind of, uh, for that squeezed kind of sector, which includes probably Kildare, Kerry, Offaly, Leash, Westmead. Like they're they're on they're really they're, they're, I just don't think Division One is of any good to them really at the moment and I think something's going to have to be changed for to make it maybe more beneficial for those teams. Yeah, I'm just looking at Westmead's performance. If you take out that heavy heavy defeat to clear the first day out and the last day out against Galway with four twenty seven to one twelve, so both of those were fairly heavy paces. since they conceded four twenty seven both days. Yeah, they were pretty good against. Wexford, in relative terms, you know, they, they were okay. They did well against the West uh, Cork team that was much changed and did okay against uh, Limerick. Killian Doyle, he's done a lot of the score. Niall O'Brien, he's been pitching in okay as well. Kieran Doyle as well. For Leash, Picky Maher has scored the most by a country mile, but he has just four points from play. Like, he has 36 points, but just four from play. Ryan Milani, remember, he scored, went up to score two goals against Watford that day. He's got four points from play otherwise. Aaron Dunphy has, has won seven, Tomas Keyes eight, James Keyes seven. They're all going to need to be pitching in big time here. And like I see some of the comments coming in here. First off, is awfully carry on also this weekend. It is. We'll come to that shortly. Pegleg Lonergan says a lot of the scores conceded against Galway. This is for Westmead, came in the last 10 minutes. Westmead will have too much for Leash. Down the years, Leash always have poor morale. They drop their heads very quickly. Um, do you know? I mean, but a couple of years ago, Leash were up against it against Antrim in that relegation playoff coming out, you know, to go down yeah. to the Joe McDonough. And they did produce the Parnell Park. So they don't always drop the heads, but they'll need a massive performance here. Yeah, even uh, in, in Eddie's second year, weren't they hammered by Dublin up in that next quarter final and bounced back and was it Waterford they should have beaten in the in the qualifiers that year? Do you know? So they have bounced back, but yeah, it's all signs would suggest that, you know, they're struggling at the moment. Uh, Ross King has probably had limited enough kind of game time too. Another one of their, you know, what would be expected to be maybe one of their marquee forwards. Willie Dunphy again has, in, has had interrupted preparation. Aaron Dunphy hit 1-4 in one of the games. Can't remember which one exactly. And they need the likes of him. Like The form he was in in 2019 was outstanding. And he just has probably struggled to get back to that form with injuries and various other bits and pieces. But uh, yeah, I'd be, I'd, be, I'd be stumping for Westmead in this one. Uh, and it, I think with Derek McNicholas back involved as well, uh, I just think, yeah, even though they've been beaten in all their games so far and the, the first and the last were quite resounding, the three in the middle were, you know, competitive enough for long stages. And just as what uh, what one of our viewers said there, you'd be expecting down the stretch if it's tight that Westmead would be the ones potentially to pull away. OK, so Kildare are already into the Division 2A final. So they, I think it was on scoring difference, basically, that they got in ahead of Offaly. Now, Offaly are against, um, against Kerry this weekend. A few weeks ago, Offaly beat Kerry by a point. That was 28 points to 118 in round three. Uh, last week, Kerry beat Derry, getting the, ensuring that they got through. So how do you see this going, and how important is it for Offaly to make sure they get to this final? Like, it'd be a bit of a blow to lose to a Kerry team that a few years ago relegated them in the league. Oh, yeah. was, it in the championship? was that the uh, league or championship? championship? Championship, yeah. Definitely relegated them in the, the, down to the Christie ring. It was down at that game, uh, one of the darkest days. Uh, David Nally scored a sideline to win, basically to win the corresponding round-robin fixture in the league. Uh, that would suggest there's going to be very little between them. Uh, Ross Ravenhill broke his ankle, actually, last weekend, which is, you know, another loss. That's with Ushin Kelly out for the cruciate again, having just come back and was the cruciate of his, you know, his good knee in inverted commas, which is a, a real a real sickener because you know, he's just the type of player we don't have. He's 6'4" just love scoring goals. We're without him now. Ravenhill out around the middle is, is going to be a loss as well. Uh, Michael be... Dyglin was talking this week about all the injuries and he was talking specifically about the Cruciates. But God, we have some amount of injuries. And we put it up there on the Our Game HQ Twitter channel as well. 
huge responses. Like people are obviously quite perturbed about this as well. Yeah, um, but like you know, I see saw some comparisons with rugby. How you see very few kind of cruciates in rugby. Uh, a lot of rugby is kind of straight line. Particularly like a barn, you're a winger or whatever, but you're generally running in straight lines. Hurling is kind of hurling and football in particular are so dynamic, and I, I don't know if it, 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 you know there's a lot of twisting and turning involved. Even you know, but there's been a lot of like in the last couple of weeks, we've had David Burke from Galway, uh, Ushin Kelly from Offaly. What other cruises have there been? Connor Sweeney from Tip, sure, there's another couple like, like they, Cadell. They, Cadell, yeah, they are quite prevalent in, in GA at the moment and it is quite it is quite worrying. I suppose the the load uh the load load management of what they're doing in training and then going out playing games and whatever, it's it's never been higher, shall we say. And Dignan kinda um just kind of referred to his own career that, you know, there were very few cruciates back in his back in his own playing days. The training was probably less, the game probably wasn't as fast as it is now. The professionalism of a game and a game increasing in standard and quality, this is probably one of the knock-on effects of it, really. As well as, well as that, like, in professional sport, they obviously, you know, they're not, they're not working or whatever. They're resting and recovering or whatever. It's not the same in amateur, but whereas, you know, there's a lot of professional demands on them. So there's probably a good few uh, different facets kind of pulled into it. But it's, you know, listen, for, for a county like Offaly, we just can't afford, no more than Tip can't afford to be without Conor Sweeney in football. You know, you just can't afford to be without marquee men like that. And I'd be um, I'd be worried enough about that game on, uh, against Kerry on Saturday now, I have to say. Yeah, like even with injuries, like is it the footwear or some lads wearing blades? Are blades more, you know, are you more likely to get injured uh, with those than others? Are lads wearing the right boots in general? Is it a problem going from like long studs to short studs when you go from different types of surfaces? Because at the moment, a lot of pitches, well, over the last few weeks, they haven't been, you can't use them because you're like, geez, we have to mind the pitch. We can't destroy the pitch for the summer now, just using it for a couple of weeks here. The goal mouths will be ruined and all that kind of stuff which we get, but then a player is going from one type of footwear to another, one surface from another, and they've been trained really hard, and who knows, like, obviously, we you don't have the same level of S&C and care with a, an amateur setup as you do with a professional setup. So there's a million and one different reasons, and it's just probably been brought to bear with the amount of injuries we're getting. And as you said, it's like players are moving faster. They're bigger. So, but, like, knees are only so strong. I mean, you can make the muscles around them stronger. But still, the body is only so strong. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of factors. And it's probably not going to go away. It's probably only going to get worse. The boots is definitely one that I would look... Like, I have I know, I've no apologies for wearing a pair of Puma Kings with long studs for my whole career or wearing a pair of Adidas World Cups. Because I just think there's there's a, they're a good, solid kind of a boot. Whereas I think a lot of the the soccer style boots now like there's there is no protection in them really like from what i can see anyway and particularly with those blades like Harry, like your grip is questionable at the best of times i just think that's a really basic facet that probably lads could put a bit more uh time and detail into i just think having it like i know it might be that fashionable but having a good sturdy boot with you know proper leather in it that actually has a bit of structure to it would definitely help uh you know, help take some of the impact away from you when you're training. Mm, a pair of world, a wear a pair of world cups will always be in fashion, won't they? Ah, oh, they're class. Yeah, I love the the Copa Mundials for the summertime are the the best in the business. Yeah. Okay. So we will just go down through the tiers in the hurling league. Wicklow are against Donegal uh, this weekend. So we'll see who's who, who's going to join. Uh, I think it's uh, let's see. The Royals are there already. Wicklow yeah, are there me, already. Yeah. 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 yeah sorry. Yeah. Yeah, me either there already. Uh, London are going to play, uh, play against Sligo to see who will join Ross Common in the final. You've also got Armagh against Monaghan, Leitrim against Longford. There's some under-20 action on this weekend. Tip Clare, Waterford, Limerick. Very hard, actually, to preview those teams and those games when you just really, you're just not that sure what teams are going to be put out and how they've been going in challenge matches and so on. Yeah, you're staring into a bit of a vacuum there until you actually see what their team is for the first game or who exactly they have available to them. Um, and if, you know, I wonder, will, will it will it be the case this year where many senior managers will put the foot down on certain players and regardless of, you know, them being allowed to play under 20 within that seven-day window as long as they're not playing senior or vice versa, will there be many senior managers that will put their foot down and say, no, no, we're 
we're we're keeping those kind of players for the senior. That would be a bit of a disaster if that was the case, especially given that the rule has been changed. I'd hope that most county boards would put their foot down and say that they play their first code first, and if they're if they're you know if they're allowed or time allows for them to play senior, then they will. Yeah. Okay. So we've already talked a fair bit of football with John Evans, and in terms of Division Two, Derry, we know they will be promoted. They're against Cork this weekend, but you know they've nothing to play for. Really, they'll probably hold, keep their powder dry until the final. They're going back to Division One for the first time since 2015. Limerick and Clare will be relegated, so Limerick are back to Division Three after one season, and Clare haven't been down there since 2016. So that's going to be a bitter pill to swallow because a couple of the games they probably left behind them, or you know, refereeing decisions went against them. Uh, Dublin. We're expecting will beat loud, but hopefully that'll be a pretty good game. Uh, Division three, uh, let's see what the table is at the moment. You've got Cavan, they're already promoted. Fermanagh down, uh, Fermanagh are on 10, down are on 8, Offaly are on 8. There's still a chance of a bit of wiggle room there. Tipperary and Longford, they're already relegated. So just in terms of the fixtures this weekend, Cavan against Fermanagh, Westmead against Tipperary, Offaly against Down, and Longford against Antrim. So Offaly beat Down last year, so they probably fancy their chances again. Yeah, here's one for you. What do you make of, like, if you're just a your manager of Cavan, right? Just say you're Mickey Graham and you're qualified for your Division 3 final and for Manor are coming to town needing a win to join you in the final. Um, but, you know, uh, the fortunes of Offaly are also dependent on somewhat on Cavan as well. So just say if Offaly beat down and Cavan put out a second string team and for Manor beat them and join them in the final, like... If you were manager, would, would that even cross your mind? Or have you got to the position where we're qualified, I've earned the right to throw in lads from between 26 and 36? Where, where would you fall on that one? If I was Mickey Graham, I would absolutely give every panellist who hasn't had game time, game time at this stage. Because he needs, like, and this is often trotted out, you know, it's, it's the players there from number 25 to 36 are the, that are the most important. Okay, are they? Play them now because obviously they need an opportunity. You've shown that you're not going to play them in the first five or six games, you know, and I mean this about any manager. So actually make good on your word. Give them the game time and I guarantee you it'll stand to you in training over the next couple of weeks because those players will feel I've had an opportunity to show my best in front of the crowd, in front of the manager, in front of the rest of the squad. So even if they end up losing the game and Fermanagh beat them, join them in the final, grand, we've got to look at what Fermanagh offer. And great, I've got an opportunity to see what player number 28 on the panel actually offers me. Yeah, I'm a big believer in, in rewarding those guys as well. And it's not just short term, it's long term as well, because there's nothing more like they are the unsung heroes that will win or lose you, you know, championships or win or lose you big championship games. And I yeah, I'd be all for giving giving them the opportunity. And I don't think even if Cavan make fifteen changes for the weekend, I like I know maybe you could say the integrity of the competition is called into question, but they've earned the right to play whoever they want at that stage. They've qualified, so I don't think anything should be put uh, at Fermanagh's door. Off they have a chance of getting through to the final, which would have been uh, wouldn't have seemed likely probably a couple of weeks ago. I know they, they came with a late flourish to beat Tip last weekend in kind of that real emotionally fueled game in Central Stadium. There would there'll be little between them and down, but probably think based on Fermanagh's form so far that they potentially could get a result against Cavan and just put it, they'll take everything out of anyone else's hands and they'll just get their own business in order. Mm. Just to circle back to the Division 2, Mead against Kildare, basically this could end up being a sort of a playoff to decide who goes into the Sam Maguire competition and who ends up in the Talchon Cup this year. And neither of these counties, with the talent they have, like, I mean, it's going wrong in both counties at the minute, but neither county would want to be in the Talchon Cup. Oh God, no, definitely not. Um, and with the, with the way Loud are going and Leinster, you're kind of thinking, and the way the draw is, they're potentially, you know, favourites on one side to get through to a Leinster final. So if uh, if Kildare, the loser of this game, if they don't get through to a, a Leinster final this year, they could be, yeah, uh, they could be Talchon Cup bound. The, the, like heads could roll over that sort of stuff. Heads Even could roll. It's a bit of maybe it's a bit of a reality check as well, though. You know what I mean? Where they, where they actually are. Neither like Mead Mead got four points on the board early doors in the league. You know they've been poor outside of that. Kildare have been you know outrageously poor. Got the result against Clare that has saved their bacon, and then got the result the last day. Um, and they're safe, but like their form has been atrocious so far. So based on their form in this year's league. Uh, heads would roll, but I'd say that's more historically maybe heads would roll than anything else. If you get me. 
Yeah, the manner of those Mead defeats to Derry and Dublin, just really, really, really uh, disappointing for them so far. Um, Division 4 then, so what's to be decided here? It's all to play for in the final round. Sligo on 10 points, Leitrim, Leash, Wicklow, 8 points. They're all vying for the two promotion places. So that makes that really exciting. Like the setup of the, the league in football, really, it really does lend itself to that bit of drama. And it's, it's a huge disappointment that basically, you know, there's a couple of games on Saturday. But on Sunday, so many of the games are all... Throw, they're all basically been played at the same time. A few of them have slightly staggered throwing times, but they're basically all clashing with each other. Really and truly, should we not have like, okay, this is best case scenario. Saturday, 5 p.m., all the Division 4 games are on. Saturday, 7 p.m., all the Division 3. Sunday, 2 p.m., all Division 2. Sunday, 4 p.m., all Division 1. And you can really go red zone on everything. Is this deja vu? Is it? I think we had. We think we've had this conversation at this stage every year for the last couple of years. Um, it just means you're putting Division Four in the spotlight for those mm. two hours. It means you're putting. Yeah, no, I to I totally agree. Um, even if it was a case, Shane, of you know, live broadcasting one of the the, the the marquee Division Four game and having all the results coming in it doesn't necessarily have to be a red zone. Having updates coming in or someone from the grounds or something like that, and you do that yeah. across definitely Division Four and Division Three anyway. Uh. And listen to a le probably to a lesser extent Division Two, and you could do it. And in we could get Je well. we could get Jeff Stelling in to do it, and get all the boys, <laughs> Paul Merson, and all the boys over as well. It'd be great fun. The, you know that clip, uh, of Steve McLaren watching watching England and Iceland, and just yeah, how yeah, yeah. Back and then yeah, like, look, we're totally in control of the game. There's no problem here. <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah. Or have you ever seen the one of Paul Merson? He's going nuts about something has happened, and then his false teeth come out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Top class. But I just think. Um, even that two hours to give Division Four the spotlight, like loud, like a louder already very cheesed off that they're not appearing on the league, so haven't appeared on the league Sunday program at all apparently this year, and they're vying for you know a final spot going into the last round as well. I just think we sh we could um we could just like uh, teams like Sligo, uh, Leitrim, they don't get to be front and center often. Whereas like I I, I think most people want to know how they're getting on, but it's it's lost in. You see Division One first, then you see Division Two to three, and then you be like, "Oh, Sligo beat Leitrim, or Leitrim beat Sligo." It's just a matter of there's a too much information happening at the one time, shall we say? Yeah, Londoner against Leash this weekend. So uh, Leash beat London by two points in last year's league. Geez, Leash have had. You know, you're expecting more from Leash, really, with the talent they have. Watford are against Wicklow. Wicklow beat Watford by eight points in the league last year. Wicklow, or Watford, obviously recorded a win last week, which was huge for them. Leitrim meet Sligo and Wexford meet Carlo. Did you watch Ireland play soccer last night? I did not, no. They won 3-2. I was at, what I was going to ask is, who's the Evan Ferguson of the, G, of the GA at the moment? That was my question I was going to ask you, but I believe it wasn't great to watch. I enjoyed it because at okay. least like Ireland are relatively limited, but at least they tried to play a bit of football, tried to pass it around. I would have liked Josh Cullen to be playing as well in the hold, you know, play as a six with two eights in front of him. Do you know about this whole soccer talk? Is he a six or an eight? Well, you know, it's, starting to, it's starting to infiltrate into, into the GA somewhat. Didn't Sean Kavanagh say a false 14 the other day? Yeah, yeah. David Fitzgerald had a unique name for Ty De Borka's role. It wasn't a sweeper. It was... Uh, it was some highfalutin language anyway that, that didn't really make sense. So as to who's the Evan Ferguson of the GA, um, Clifford? That's always uh, the answer. No, no, but no, Clifford's too established. You're kind of thinking of, I'd be kind of thinking of maybe a Billy Drennan type player, maybe, who's all the talk. No, because he's all the talk. Like, he hasn't played championship yet and he's all the talk and he's lighting it up for he's lighting it up for his county at the moment in the league but now you're expecting to see whether he light it up in championship do you know what i mean I, clifford has been footballer of the year he's definitely not the no but i, I thought the, you meant at, a, at 18 no more a player that uh is ready to explode onto the scene okay all right i misunderstood you from that point of view yeah who else other than billy drennan at that age yeah because we kind of talked to kieran joyce Kieran Joyce, and from a football point of view, probably someone like Rory Canavan, maybe. Um, yeah. Yeah, who's getting ready to really make a mark at senior level. Okay, right. So that's pretty much it for the show today, isn't it? We've all yeah, we, we, we just managed to keep it under the two-hour mark. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, that's it. Uh, as I said, we are doing the live GA Club fundraisers. If you want us to come to your town and help you raise funds for the year, uh, get on to us, events at ourgame.ie. Michael, we'll do it again on Monday. Cheers, Shannon.